Hello and welcome to the March 13th, 2024 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. The time is 7.02. All are present, including Aaron Jock and Dave Domek, Amherst staff. Um, let's see, shall we oh, take off our meeting? But okay, before we do that, Aaron, we had talked about some settings for um participants to see number of other participants. Did that get any clarity? Um let me see. I'm sorry, I completely forgot about it until just now and I'm not sure um that I am the instructions I was I was given are not Hold on one second. View participant count. Yes, I found it. Awesome. It should be there. Yes, I got it. Thank you. Okay. Well, if anybody gives public comment, we should perhaps ask them if it's working. Um, so just okay. to fill everybody in, this is so that a setting so that other public participants can see how many other public participants there are. So Zoom restricts a lot of things about naming of other participants, but this is just a bit of transparency that we can give to public meeting. Okay, thank you, Erin. Um, all right, first up, chair reports. I have none, so handing it over to you, Dave, go ahead. So for the sake of time, um, I don't really have any updates. The only thing I will share with the commission is that um, the town manager will make a an appointment to the commission on Monday night, uh, 318. So um, Michelle, Aaron, myself, and a few others interviewed uh, a number of candidates for commission seats, commission seat, singular one, and uh, uh, Paul Bachman will make that recommendation or make that appointment and recommendation, if you will, to the council. I think it's his appointment, but he needs to have it confirmed by the council. So that'll happen on Monday night, the 18th. So you will have a full commission at that point. That's my only update. Um, I know we're going to talk about Puff Respond. I don't know if we're going to do that now or later in the meeting, but I'll go with the flow. You're muted, Michelle. I'm just going to follow the agenda item. So next up, I have open space and rec plans, which I think is, oh, we got a question. I think it's just There's spread the word and- To approve Chris. the minutes before that. Oh, you're right, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you. Um, following on the agenda as stated, let's approve some minutes. Okay, looking for a motion to approve minutes from 228-2024. Good move. I move to approve minutes from 228-24. I will second. For, okay, got Jason on the second. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce. Aye. Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. You're muted, Laura. Aye. Can you hear me? Yes. Now I can. Thank you. Okay. And I'm an aye. Thank Great. you, Bruce. All right. Now on to land management updates. Aaron, do you want to just give us the, is, I mean, beyond yeah, the, the point? The survey is still going out. Um, we're just trying to spread it as far and wide as we can. So if anybody knows of any organizations or otherwise that would be good to share this with so that residents of Amherst can um, can access the survey, please do. It's been sent pretty far and wide by town staff, but um, it's it's still open. So we want to just collect as much information and data as we can. Um, we do have a um, land use application for um, the Mount Pollock stargazing, which has been an ongoing um, uh, permit that has been renewed. I think this is the third renewal on it, um, so I don't think it's... Um, it, we haven't had any complaints or issues with the stargazers, um, and they've been following their um their permit just fine so 
um, from a staff standpoint, I would suggest that we just carry forward all of the conditions that have been set from the previous iterations of the um, stargazing land use permit. Thanks, Aaron. Any questions, commissioners? When would that be? <clears throat> when is the stargazing? Sorry, was was the question, when is the stargazing? Yes. Um, so it's, I, I've got multiple screens open, so I can't see people's faces. Um, so it's uh, proposed, they do it throughout the, the summer season. Um, they're proposed, or throughout the, the season as a whole. They're proposing, um, <clears throat> basically mid-January, they proposed a start date, um, and the, they... Um, it says event end time 11 p.m. They usually do it in the evening. Let me just see if um, Kathy Buckley is here from the Stargazer group to tell us a little more about it. I think she did join. Um, so I'm going to pull her in so that she can answer a little more about what the Stargazing um, experience is like at Mount Pollux. Hi, everyone. So um, <clears throat> it kind of because it's dependent on weather and cloud cover and what it kind of comes together pretty fast. Um, but I work for a program that uh, serves boys who have had a, a lot of abuse and neglect. And it's myself and one or two other staff. Um, I take usually it's a maximum of four kids with us so we have six or seven people two vehicles we get there around dusk and um we're kind of there as long as there's stuff to see and um but we usually um we're usually done by um 11 um we park two vehicles in the available parking lot, <clears throat> usually one to two telescopes, couple folding chairs. Um, we're obsessive about making sure any trash gets, it, we bring trash bags with us and they're lugged out. <clears throat> we're also obsessive about making sure that, you know, the kids aren't rowdy. We don't allow them to bring music or anything so that there's nothing that would disrupt the neighbors or other people. Thanks, Kathleen. Sounds like you know the drill and the rules. Um, the, I think the other thing that we ask is that you let the Amherst police know and put a sign in the car. Is that generally something that we say because they do patrols up to Mount Pollux after oh. sunset? I usually just, um, <clears throat> the only time the police have actually ever showed up was the that that was actually how I discovered that Mount Pollux closes at dusk now, um, and that that we needed this permit. Um, but I carry the permit with me. Um, I can certainly make you know phone calls to the police to let them know, or or if there's something you would recommend that I have. So like, do I? I just keep the permit with me, so if they do come, we can just we have it to show them. I think we copied the police department on the permit last time. So they were copied on the, the permit to know that this was going on at Mount Pollux periodically, um, just as an FYI. Thanks. Dave? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. I think this is all good. Um, copy of the permit on, on, you know, keeping it with you, letting the APD know. I, I would just tape a, a, sign, a small sign to your window, too, because that's what they're likely to do is look in, make sure if there's nobody in the car having an issue or they're doing things they're not supposed to. But uh, many times they they may not have the time to walk all the way up to the top of the hill. So it's great to just put a sign saying, you know, who's up there, you know, why you're doing it and just just to have backup. Yeah, okay. maybe you just tape the permit to your window so they don't yeah. have to walk up the hill. It's all good. Okay. Yeah, sometimes uh, we don't eat, sometimes we don't actually even go up the hill. Sometimes we just stay in the parking lot. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. think having a permit on the car is generally just good okay. practice. Cool. Andrea, I can leave it in the I can just leave it in the window. 
Yeah, perfect. I, Alex is first, Andre, so I'm just going to ask him. Go ahead, Alex. Kathleen, I was just curious because you need a permit and the place closes at dusk. Have you had problems with people coming into the parking lot and somehow wanted to join you? Has it happened? Yes. I wouldn't say that it's ever been problem. Like it's, it's not at all uncommon for there to be people who come by and who are there or up the hill or whatever. Um, sometimes they will ask if they can look, but they, they've always been, polite, respectful, pleasant. The telescope is um, also computerized, so it broadcasts on my phone and my tablet. So you don't actually have to look at the telescope to see what the telescope is seeing. So it's easy for people to, and it moves on its own. So people, it, it looks cool. Great. Andre? But no, but nobody's ever been belligerent or problem problematic with us. Good to know. Go ahead, Andre. Yeah, uh, Kathleen. Uh, the last thing that you that that you're gonna want is for uh, to be disrupted or interrupted by uh, police coming up there or whatever. I I also recommend uh, that you actually call their business number okay. the evening of and let them know they'll just when they see your vehicle they'll just recognize it and leave instead of going up and talking to you. That gives okay. them a, a proper heads up that they don't waste their time as well. Okay. And yeah. Everybody's happy. Yeah. Thanks. Well, and, and, you know, I mean, people see my last name and it rings certain bells because my dad's picture is hanging on the wall. <laughs> it, the reason we go to Mount Pollux is I am an Amherst native. <clears throat> In fact, I, uh, Dave, I, I went to school with Andy and John. Right. Um, Laura, go ahead. Yeah, no, all I was going to say is that we have done this successfully well in the past, so I don't think there's there's any issues. So, um, Kathleen, thanks for thanks for adhering always to what we set for um, in the, the permit, um, which is not always the case, so uh, we appreciate it. Yep, okay, so call Amherst PD in the, in the evening of and keep your permit in the window. Just tape it on there and everybody is good. And I think we're all good to make a motion to approve this one. I don't I mean, so do yeah. I don't have a um I don't have a um a motion drafted, but um this is permit number um CLU twenty four dash one. So um just to approve permit CLU twenty four dash one with the noted conditions. So moved. Second. Alex on the motion. Andre on the second. Bruce. Aye. Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. Nam and I. All right. Thank you, Kathleen. Have fun up there. Thanks. Okay. Um, Huffers Pond. See, we have a PowerPoint. Yeah. Dave, do you want to jump into that now? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, how much time do we have before your first hearing? Yeah, 15 minutes, so plenty yeah. of time. Okay. We, can, we can do this quickly. This is kind of a first look. So maybe Aaron could tee up the first slide. And we're going to go fairly quickly. I know you saw this in the packet, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, just today, I though. Just kind of saw it. So um, I just want to check in about expectations for the conversation tonight. Is this sort of like a preliminary presentation of this? Yeah, this is a very preliminary okay. conversation. I'd like to allocate some additional time, obviously, you know, any time over the next couple of commission meetings. But this is really the expectation really is is very, um, very soft. Uh, it's just a first look at some of the work that we've been doing behind the scenes to begin to think about uh, a new vision for Puffer's Bond. So um, very quickly, I'll, I'll move quickly and Aaron, you can jump in um, where you'd like, but as, as many of you know, Puffer's, we've been working on Puffer's Bond, we've been maintaining Puffer's Bond, uh, we've owned Puffer's Bond for decades. Um, we've done as much as we possibly can through the years from dredging to dam and dike improvements to beach improvements, 
Um, but the pond clearly is getting, um, you know, a tremendous amount of use in the summer, uh, increasingly so, particularly as we get more days over the uh, 90 degree temperature. We're also seeing, um, you know, great challenges with water quality. We know that the dike at Buffers Pond needs significant work. It is um, currently um, um, rated by the state in poor condition. The dam is in better condition. It's rated in fair, con fair condition by, by the state. Um, but um, so Aaron, Aaron and I did some brainstorming, you know, during the past uh, six or eight months. And we, we came together um, with a small amount of funding that I had in the capital plan and we pulled together a group from Fuss and O'Neill uh, engineering firm and uh, began to do a little um, staff um, um, outlining visioning about A, some of the challenges that Buffer Spawn faces and B, some of the potential um, solutions or approaches that, that we might take up at Puffers. Um, again, this is clearly just a draft. It's to get us all thinking about what Puffer Spawn could be if we had the funding, if we had the design, um, how could we make Puffers Pond uh, a place to celebrate and to bring more people safely uh, to the pond while at the same time safeguarding the resources there? So next slide. I think so this just is a quick intro slide. You know, this is the, the internal team we pulled together. Um, next slide. I'm going to go fairly quickly. Um, we really had three major phases here. We're just going to talk about phase one and phase two tonight, investigate and engage and initiate and explore. Um, obviously, investigate and engage was an opportunity to come together and look at what are some of the challenges and opportunities out at the pond. Next slide. We'll keep going. Um, I think we've gone even beyond that, but Aaron, jump in anytime. I, clearly, this is just one slide illustrating the issue of sedimentation in the pond. Uh, you know, the um, two major sources of sediment coming into the pond, one is the Cushman Brook, and two are the beaches eroding on either side, and then bank erosion uh, on the north, north um, west side, I guess. Um, but this is just an interesting slide illustrating the, the, the evolving delta, the growing delta there as the far side of the pond uh, fills in with sediment. Um, next slide. So we've talked a little bit about purpose. Um, you know, Humphrey's Pond is a, is a multi-purpose resource for the town. In fact, years ago before my time with the town and, and I think everybody on this call, um, Puffer's Pond at one point was the beaches there were managed by the Recreation Department many, many years ago. Um, that switched over or back to the Conservation Department uh, through the Commission um, some probably 30 years ago. And here we are. The challenges uh, each year that we face with more and more people at the beaches, these slides just kind of illustrate some of the overcrowding there, uh, the, the, the public safety challenges on State Street with um, parking and and uh, lack of parking, but also the kind of um, uh, um, unorganized nature of the parking. And then, um, you know, some of the other slides here just show uh, some of the erosion into the pond and uh, how the pond is filling in. Um, here we have some of the current conditions at the pond. Uh, this is mostly the main beach, um, the south beach. Um, showing erosional erosional uh, forces of rain and and water, uh, just eroding all of the sand into the pond and uh, creating unsafe conditions both uh, at the beaches but also at the the uh, perimeter trail. Next slide. Um, I think we've kind of covered this. We're going pretty quickly here tonight. We'll have plenty of time at a future meeting. I did want to also mention that. Um, uh, some years ago, um, I pulled together a group that put together a plan that some of you may have seen, which is called Puffer's Bond 2020. And um, that group identified many of the same things that are still a challenge at the pond. Um, but of course, back when we were doing that visioning work, climate change was not in the forefront of any of our thinking. So clearly for us, for Aaron, myself, Stephanie, and some of the planning department, 
climate change um, is a real factor for us as we thought about this this plan. How is climate how, how is climate change affecting impacting water quality at the pond? How is climate um, how should we plan for climate change and think about Puffer's Pond? Uh, we are thinking of it now as kind of a cooling center for the town. Uh, as we approach the days when we will have many, many more summer days over, as I mentioned, over the over 90 degrees, this is in fact a cooling center for many of our residents who aren't able or um, can't afford a backyard pool or to go to the Cape or to go to Maine. Um, this is a place for thousands of people to recreate every summer. Erin, you want to jump in here just on guiding principles? Yeah, I mean, I think just as we start to look at the the upcoming images, you know, I just want to make sure that it's clear, you know, the sort of principles we had in mind with all of the suggested um, infrastructure changes that you're going to see. And, and again, these are just conceptual ideas. These aren't, not all of these things are going to happen. These are just theoretical. Like if we were dreaming how we would, you know, all of the potential options we could come up with and with the idea of ecological restoration in mind, how to restore a lot of the degraded riverfront and, and um, you know, beach areas that have erosion, um, enhance wildlife habitat, um, restore a lot of areas of wetland that have been trampled by, like the sort of desire lines that have been created at Puffer's Pond, the public health and safety elements, you know, improvements for folks to have, you know, year, like, you know, toilets that function or, you um, potential for like improved safety. Um, I don't know anybody who's brought kids um, to, on a hot day to Puffer's Pond knows it's dangerous walking down that road. Um, ADA access, so making sure folks with disabilities have equal opportunity to come to the pond. Um, potential for um, future educational opportunities there and then improvements to the way that sort of the operation and maintenance of the of the pond. Well, keep going there. I'll jump in. Yeah, so these are like um, all of these numbered stations are all um, sort of adjustments or areas where we've, you know, recommended making improvements from water quality, dam and dike repairs. Um, uh, you know, we have on our mind repairing the dam and repairing the dike. We know those are top issues here. We also have on our mind dredging the pond and for reasons of water quality, because there's so much sediment um, and um, because of the deposition that's happening there, it's really causing a lot of water quality issues in addition to obviously um, upstream impacts that are contributing to the pond. Um, so enhance, enhancements to pedestrian access, um, parking, um, improving the trail system, um, et cetera. And you guys can look through this. Again, this is more of a just an intro. So I'm going to keep moving so you can see some of these sort of ideas in play. Um, so like wildlife viewing, um, improving the beaches to the point of, you know, regrading them and, and improving them so that they're not eroding into the ponds. Um, some water quality infrastructure improvements, um, areas of like complete restoration and mitigation um, on the site itself. Um, it's one of the big issues that has come to us are um, issues of between swimmers and fishermen or fisher people. Um, so like um, bad interactions that happen between swimmers and people who are fishing. And so here we're trying to basically create sort of designated areas to try to help separate some of that to the degree that we can. Um, yeah, so and then um, one really interesting thing here you'll see is this this potential boardwalk coming across from the main beach to connect over to sort of the, the existing sort of fishing area. And this is because right now we have this trail that comes in off State Street going through a wetland and, and this whole area has been impacted by human use. So the idea would be to restore this area and sort of have a concentrated um, area of, of for traffic and, and pedestrian use that would have less impact on the um, surrounding beach area. Um, potential area of a comfort station, you know, for like say composting toilets or otherwise, um, you know, right now we use porta potties on a seasonal basis, but we're not quite sure what's causing E. coli um, impacts 
yet. We're, you know, hoping to explore that, but um, a potential comfort station might help with that. And then again, you know, repairs to the beach. Let me jump in for a second too, Erin, before we go on. Um, just so the commission knows and any of the viewing public know, knows, there is no dedicated budget for Puffer's Pond. Uh, there's no staff budget. There's no, the town has never had a dedicated budget just for Puffer's. When in fact, you know, I would argue that in some summers, the visitation to Puffer's actually outnumbers or our numbers are greater than those that um, visit the public pools at Mill River and, and War Memorial. So part of the reason for putting this plan together is to bring people together, the commission, the recreation commission, the community to say, what do we want this, this pond to be like five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30, 30 years down the road? I'm often quoted in the newspaper as saying we're loving Puffer's Pond to death, and I think generally we are. Um, it gets the visitation is too high for the resource to to absorb and to maintain. So the idea is how could we create spaces? How could we, as Aaron said, make it accessible while at the same time um, protecting some of the natural resources? Just to give you an idea, you know, the comfort station here, and again, this is just conceptual. Um, the comfort station could be anywhere on the main beach, set back in the woods. Um, but um, just to give you an idea, we spend on average seven to ten thousand dollars a year just on porta potties. So where does that money come from? It comes from a combination of of my creativity with our budget, but also a small fundraising uh, effort by the Friends of Puffer's Pond, and they do a tremendous um, job every year on the um, the pancake uh, breakfast. And again, they raise between six and maybe seven thousand dollars a year. But this plan, a plan, could really galvanize the community to come together so that we can do some private fundraising as well as write some grants uh, to try to seek funding for some of these initiatives. I should also say that dredging, you know, is a decision the town will need to make. It's probably the largest ticket item in this entire plan. It is larger than dike improvements. It's more expensive than dike improvements, more expensive than dam improvements. It is the big the big uh, the big nugget in all of this um it is you know clearly over a million dollars we don't have cost estimates yet but we're part of this plan is to develop cost estimates for dredging next slide again giving kind of an overview of the north beach with some potentially um, improved parking on the north beach the idea at least the concept of a small pavilion on the north beach where people could get out of the uh, get out of the sun and um, making the North Beach accessible to people uh, with disabilities. Again, looking at dike repairs and safety improvements to the dike, and then regrading the beach so it doesn't erode on an annual basis. Next slide. Kind of more of the same, a little bit of a close up, more of a close up of the North Beach. I think we can move on. This is a, a conceptual idea for a, a trail, part of the trail around the perimeter of the pond to make that trail accessible to people of all abilities, to allow anyone to experience getting out uh, into the water or over the water to fish, to, to sunbathe, to do yoga, to enjoy the beauty of Buffer's Pond and do it in a way that doesn't degrade the resources, the bank resources, the wetland resources, et cetera. Next slide. And I think that's kind of where we're at. I will say that um, Aaron and I have worked with Fuss and O'Neill on some implementation um, phasing, and we're happy to talk with you about that at a, a future meeting. Um, this is not a short-term endeavor. This is many years of work ahead of us. Um, we are preparing right now to submit a uh, grant proposal to the dam and see the state dam and seawall program um, to at least get started on some of the design work, particularly for the dike dam and dredging, at least to look at bathymetry. How much sediment do we have in the pond? We don't know. Are, are the sediments in the pond uh, in any way um, uh, things that we should be worried about? 
Um, there is an industrial history, a mill history uh, of the Cushman Brook above Fuffer Spond. So we need to look at those sediments and get cores and see what's in those sediments. Earlier um, bathymetry work and cores did indicate um, that some of those sediments may be compromised and we need to get those out of there. So a lot of work ahead of us and we're hoping to, to get some funds from the state to address some of the dam and dike issues as well as look at uh, what it would take to dredge the pond. So we'll stop there and if we have a couple of minutes, we can take any questions and continue this at a future date. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Aaron. Laura, you want to ask a question? Yeah, I, I do. But do you have time right now, Michelle? We have a hearing. I mean, again? if it's I'll, short, I'll just hours. make I'll just make a quick yeah quick question. Is um, you know, you compared it to um the Mill River Pool, and you know we live so close to we're in Amherst, but we live close to Delta Town Beach. Has there been any consideration for like charging people an entry, um, as a way to sort of control numbers and generate revenue, um, to continue? It's one thing to like. I think the plan is beautiful and like I wish it was happening in like right now. Uh, but I think about like the ongoing costs and cost of maintaining toilets and you know all, all of those things. So I don't know if that's been considered. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's part of our kind of the planning that we're doing, Laura. And, and again, in the future, we can share some of that with the commission and with the community. Um really, um, this is the first. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but this is the first public viewing of these slides and, and these conceptual ideas and the ideas to hone them with you, working with you, working with the Recreation Commission and working with the community. We'd like to go out and talk with the friends of Buffers Pond. We'd like to talk with the neighbors and neighborhoods around the pond. But to your question, Laura, um, I, the, the, I think the short answer is um, we don't think we can charge, um, we can't charge people to enter a public conservation area, unlike uh, Belchertown Beach, which as far as I know is not conservation land. I think that's owned by the town of Belchertown. We, however, can do systems of, say, um, parking passes for uh, State Street or parking, um, think of Lake Wyola. Um, Lake Wyola charges a very modest fee to park. I believe yes. at one point it was five dollars a car or yes. something like that. So there may be ways for us to come up with a permit system where Amherst residents could buy a permit for a very reasonable rate and park, say, Lab uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day on State Street or an improved parking area there. And then non-residents might pay X plus Y um, because, in fact, non-residents, their tax tax dollars are not maintaining anything at Buffer Spot and they're taking advantage of this incredible resource. So we may look at something like that. I think that's part of the funding future of Puffers, but nothing obviously has been decided. But we can't charge to enter a, um, and we can't fence it either. No, <clears throat> nobody would want to fence Buffer Spot. But we'll look at all of that as, as some sort of a funding package. Those are interesting considerations. We should keep them on the table, I think. Um, Alex, I think you're next, but we're um, running over into our 7.30, so please just keep it concise. Am I usually long-winded? <laughs> Go for it, Alex. Um, if we're talking about a grand plan, would you consider putting a fishway on the dam that would pass eels trout and other fish because the dam creates, it fragments the river. And um, there are eels in, in Puffer's Pond, they can get around, but but it's not easy. And there are trout down below in Mill River and up above in Cushman Brook. And uh, it would be nice in the grand plan of things to uh, have continuity upstream and downstream. So without discussion, I would suggest you consider putting a fishway on the dam. I think that's an excellent idea for all of us to consider, Alex. Yeah, I second that idea. I see a lot of like natural sediment movement, but it's all dammed up. <laughs> so it'd be nice if something was moving. Go ahead, Bruce. Looking to see if there's any member of the public that has a comment. Thanks, a Bruce. Lot of people in the I see no hands raised, but um, if there's anyone in the public, please raise your hand if you have any quick comments on this one. We're gonna continue this conversation. This was a preliminary um, 
viewing of the grand plan, but um, go ahead. Seeing none. Well, I'm very interested to hear about the dredging plan too, Dave. I feel like it's sort of the big ticket item that's gonna solve the big problem, which you don't see on those pretty plans is that you can't swim in the water if the water is not safe. <laughs> so um, to be continued. All right, um, if there's nothing else, let's move on to our 7.30. Um, this is notice of intent for SWC on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for the construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structures in the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetate wetlands at lot 13, Olympia Drive, map 8D, lot 15, 16, 3. I realize I need to open the hearing procedures. So each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda. The hearing structure is five minutes of comments from staff, five minutes for the applicant, five minutes of public comment or two minutes per person, and then five minutes for conservation commissioners. We now require that all submitted and revised materials are submitted by Wednesday, the week prior to the meeting at close of business. And for all presenters, please state your name, address, who you're representing, as well as preferred pronouns. Okay, so Aaron, do you wanna give us an update on SWCA? Yes. Um, so I received a request to continue this hearing um, until uh, the March 27th meeting. I also took into consideration sort of our policy discussions um, that we had at the last meeting and framed up a, uh, a motion for, for your consideration as far as um, requesting a comprehensive response to the outstanding um, comments and required revisions um, and to allow a little bit of time um, basically until April 2nd, which is um, our submission deadline for the first meeting in April for the applicant to provide um, the outstanding information that we've been waiting for since basically early November. Um, so I have that framed up for your consideration. Obviously, you don't you don't have to do that. You can just think about it now or talk about it now. Um, I did talk to Kristen, who's the representative for um, UMass, and what she let me know was that um, the intention is for them to be prepared for the meeting on the 27th. Um, this motion is basically an insurance policy in case they're not prepared or in case they only come back with a partial response. Um, so that we can try to get responses by the first meeting in April. Um, so their intention is to be prepared by the meeting on the 27th, but um, you know they're not certain that they're going to have everything uh, revised and, and submitted to us by that time. So this gives them an extra a little bit of time if they need it. Um, and they said at the very least, they should have everything ready for April 2nd. So um, just to, for your discussion as you consider a continuation. Thanks, Aaron. Bruce, is your hand up? Yes. So the deadline for the materials, if we stuck with the 27th, is March 20th, the week before, correct? Right. If we if we change it to the 10th of April, then the deadline is, is April 3rd, not the 2nd. Um, but so the real question is, do you think, based on what you know from them, that they actually would be able to get everything to you by the 20th of March, or are they going to have another flood of materials on the 22nd or the 25th or even the 26th of March, expecting that it can all come together? I, I just don't think that's very likely. So in talking with Kristen, I know she's meeting with UMass tomorrow, but she didn't have a uh, um, a firm response that they would definitively have everything to us on the on the 20th. So she was unsure if everything was going to be ready for that submission deadline on the 20th, which is why I had suggested pushing to the next meeting because that gives a couple a couple more weeks to prepare. I did talk to her about this discussion and let her know that, you know, the commission was getting, was starting to feel that there were some um, sort of due process issues with the fact that this has been continued 11 times um, and that they would like to see the next time that UMass comes to them for there to be some, something to talk about and some, some responses, but she was not certain that they would have everything by the 20th. So that's why 
I allowed for some extra wiggle room. So Bruce, if they did have a flood of materials on the 23rd or whatnot, they still would need to continue to the April, the next April meeting. And that's when we would, we they would have to continue one more time and that's when we'd hear them. So I feel like this is giving them a bit of a buffer and it's a, a fair offer. Um, Andre, go ahead. Yeah, I think if there's a, you know, it, it's it, it's starting to become apparent that uh, what we really need to do is is wait until the is give them an extra uh, an extra two weeks after that. In other words, to to uh, to just go ahead with the suggestion of uh, April uh, twenty uh, or April uh, what is it fourteenth, April tenth. Thanks. That's what that's worth. Any other commissioner comments? Public comments? If not, looking for a motion. No, Alex. Yeah, Alex has a comment. Oh, sorry, Alex. Go ahead. Okay. Um, it occurs to me that the commission has has trouble finding time to talk about issues uh, and discuss them amongst itself. We had a discussion last time about continuations and it was at the end of our agenda everybody was tired and uh, uh we have two other issues that we wanted to talk about and i would if we're going to get a flood of information from them i would rather put them off a little bit more and hold make room on the agenda for our discussions um and take care of the business and that would give them a little extra time to get this work done um, so I would favor giving them as much time as we possibly can and still put uh, our issues on the agenda for maybe the next two meetings and put them at the top of the agenda. Thanks, Alex. I mean, no matter what they give us, flood or not, and sometimes we get floods and sometimes they don't get not, that we still have this one-week buffer to our meeting. So that's pretty standard. Um, so... I don't think we're going to get any last minute anything. And if we did, then, you know, I'm sure Aaron has made it apparent to them what our new um, standard is for submission of materials and maybe just reiterate that to them since this has been long enough that maybe it's changed since they were last um, involved with us, but so that they know that we need an entire week before our meeting to review anything that they've given us. All right. I mean, Alex, are you are you okay with this motion, or can we move on with it? Is did I address your concern? If we can make time on the agenda in the next couple of meetings for us to talk to ourselves, yeah, I'm fine with it. Yeah, I think that's probably a separate discussion then that we can also bring up today is what those items are. Okay. If there's nothing else, um, looking for a motion on this one. I will motion to uh, move to require comprehensive responses to outstanding comments and required plan revisions from staff correspondence dated 8 2023 with the exception of comment number one, where work was already found to have been completed in 1970 prior to WPA. Concert comprehensive responses and plan revisions are expected to be submitted to the Conservation Commission no later than April 3rd, 2024. These are responses and revisions. These responses and revisions are necessary to determine project compliance under the Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations. If responses and plans revisions are not submitted by the April 3rd, 2024 date, the commission will issue a denial for lack of information under 310 CMR 10.05 subsection 6C, Wetlands Protection Act regulations, and 3E7 subsection 2 Town of Amherst bylaw regulations. Well done, Jason. I'll Thanks. second that, but but I think the date was April, th April 2nd. No, is that? Bruce uh, corrected third. that, so it's good. Yeah. 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 Okay. April 3rd is corrected, yep. All right, Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. second. All right, question? Yep. 
for the motion itself is the date April 10th. If the material in the, are we only doing the first motion? We're canceling the second one on the, there's two options here, right? No, um, I'd, I'd like to do both. Um, but so, so now that the first motion is, is made, um, I think we should take a vote on it and then we can talk about the second motion. So they've asked for a continuation to the 27th in the instance that they have everything completed by the 20th. And if they don't have everything completed by the 20th, they would request another continuance to the April 10th meeting, but that would be sort of the final continuation, um, date that we would allow for this. And okay. that's kind of the idea. But if the commission's uncomfortable with that, we could just continue to yeah. April 10th and not have it on our next agenda. That's another consideration here. I mean, I don't see why we, if they have everything ready, what's, what's the difference really? We'll have a week either way. And really this is about whether or not we deny on the basis of not providing the information in a timely manner, or we continue as we would any other hearing. So we're not we're not off script in here, except whether, you know, based on our consideration of other matters, we're giving them, we're letting them know that they need to provide some due diligence and some material for us to review if we're gonna continue this again. But with the provision of that, we can take it back up. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah, I just have one question. So if we put them on next um, meeting agenda, they don't have the materials and have a move to the 10th of April. We have to have this exact same slide again, talking about this exact same issue and then saying we're moving to continue again to the April 10th. You know, I'm just, you know, like I just want to look at that. It's not the exact same slide because we've already decided if they are not prepared by April 10th, then we deny the permit. So we're giving them basically a buffer to do this. And they've and said, oh, we'll be ready by the 27th and we'll but maybe not. So this is like a last, okay. this is the last if, opportunity. And if they're not, if they're not ready by next week's meeting, we have to then vote again for a continuance. We're just saying. Yes. And that would be the last continuance before denial of the permit. So we have a motion, we have a second. Hey, I have a question before we vote. Yeah. I got confused. You said that the way I saw this is if they do not, provide, then we will issue a denial. And what I think I just heard you say is that we have to give them an additional two weeks before we can issue the denial. Can oh, I, can I try ahead, to address this? Ahead. So we have two meetings before the 10th. We have a meeting in two weeks, which is on the uh, 27th of March, and we have another meeting on the 10th of April. What this is saying is we're, we're, we're giving them notice right now that if they don't have the materials to us by April 3rd, it's gonna be denied on the 4th of April. The, the permit is gonna be denied on the 4th of April. They've indicated to us they're gonna have the materials to us by the 20th and they're gonna be prepared for the 27th. So that's why they've requested a continuance to that date. It's at the commission's discretion whether you want to continue to the 27th right now and if they don't have materials ready we would you know they would have until april 3rd to get them to us if they do get a, us the materials by the 20th we could hear it on the 27th so this is offering that flexibility there but if the commission would rather just continue it to the 10th and get it off next agenda in two weeks that's also an option to consider go ahead jason um Supposing that they do get us everything on the 20th and then we hear it on the 27th and then we're not moving forward, we like, uh, we don't end up approving it or like we, we decide that, oh, we still have to meet again and we need more information because I believe one of the outstanding thing is that we were going to potentially have a third party review of their wetland delineation. Correct. And so if we do that, that if we ask for that, then that's going to kick this down the road, you know, however many more weeks. And then right. we're coming into the summertime, you know, we're coming in the spring, right? But, uh, you know, I don't know when we, potentially a third party reviewer can get out there. So I, I'm just curious 
if we get to the 27th, they get everything to us by the 20th, are we going to make a determination? I know we can't necessarily say we're going to make a determination that day, but you know, I think what if, if they respond to the comments in good faith and give us the information we need and provide the revisions we need, the commission then can take the opportunity to review those materials and decide, do we need a peer review? And if so, we initiate the peer review, or maybe the revisions are adequate for the commission to consider issuance, or maybe we need additional information. And at that point, that decision would be made. All this is saying is if they continue to not submit responses and planned revisions we can't keep continuing because we've already had 11 continuations yeah and i i guess when i read this motion i thought that i kind of was reading it as rather than issuing a continuation to the 27th we were basically saying no just get all of your information together and come back on the 10th or have everything to us by april 3rd so what you're saying is we're we're telling them April 3rd, you don't have the stuff to us. We're we're denying it for lack of information, but you have the opportunity to come to us on the 27th, but you have to have all of that information to us by the 20th. Yeah. Well, okay. That's no, you don't have to have if they choose to have the meet, if they choose not to continue on the 27th, all that information is available on the 20th. So, I mean, this is consistent with what Aaron just said is consistent with the conversation we had about how many continuances we have and what's our policy for allowing them. And really like when Aaron and I talked, we we thought two weeks, if we're gonna give a hard deadline for a denial that that seemed fair. And then the applicant really wanted to shoot for the 27th. So that that is a allowance that we're giving them is that they are hopeful of the 27th and we're saying hard deadline is the 10th. Okay. I mean, I see what you're saying about getting into the season and the third party review, but really like what we wanted from them was some good faith effort to address all the comments in um, their entirety. And so what if they do and we don't want a third party review? Like that's part, just part of the hearing process. So I think that's where we wanted to be 11 hearings ago. Mm -hmm. I guess if people wanted to, we could say we're just continuing it to the 10th and not give them the 27th if you feel like that's better use of our time. Okay, Bruce. My preference would be to only have one motion tonight. Don't pass yeah. two motions, it's too confusing. Well, okay, Andre? Uh, in somewhat in agreement with her, Bruce, essentially, uh, I, th I think we just, stick to the uh, April 10th so that uh, they have enough time and uh, for sure it's uh, make or break on the 10th and then uh, we don't need to be we don't need to schedule them for the 27th we don't need to uh, have to you know to take that time and and move it forward again we just uh, uh, get it uh, get it all in one shot and uh, I, I do see that it's somewhat confusing to have two motions like this. Um, so yeah, no, I'm I'm all for uh, letting them have the full uh, the full time and uh, see where it goes. Um, yeah, if not, it's 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 a little bit confusing. Thanks, Andre. Alex, I agree that we're the commission is a, is a bit confused. But I, and I favor having one motion, and I favor the first motion. But I, I really, I, to tell you the truth, I, I really want to have them come forward because there's a whole lot of stuff that we are interested in in that project, which, uh, and I'd hate to have the opportunity to go away. So, um, but it's time to put up or shut up. <laughs> okay, I think I've got the sense from you guys, but can we do a hand vote on? Um... Who is in favor of, how do I put this, extending, including the ability for them to present on the 27th? Yeah. Okay, I see no hands. Okay, who is in favor of 
continuing to the April the, 10th only. By the way, Michelle, yeah. just the way our screens are, I can't see but half the screen for everybody. There we go. Okay, and so nobody raised their hand. And my next question is, who is in favor of continuing to the 10th only and not the 27th? Okay, I see a majority there. Okay. All right, so I think we need to edit the motion or do we revise the second motion? Go ahead, Eric. So, so we need two separate motions on this because in on one we're saying we're setting a deadline. This is a statutory requirement. We're setting a deadline that if you don't submit this information by this date, you're going to be denied for lack of information. That's one motion. We need a vote on that motion. The second motion is the continuance to the date you guys decide on. And I am completely fine with us that date being um, April 10th. But we do need two separate motions because if we neglect either one, we're not going to get the desired result. Okay. Yeah. So ahead, just, just real quick, and I think this might, uh, you know, you've just clarified it for me uh, quite clear as can be. The first motion that we've already read is giving them an ultimatum. The second motion is when are we going to take this up? Right. And uh, we take it up either on the 27th or on the uh, on the 10th. And it's quite apparent from our conversations that we're looking to do it on the 10th. So I think what we need to do now is is vote on that uh, that one motion that we've uh, read already and uh, then move on to uh, the second motion and uh, put in place the uh, the the. Uh, 410 uh, for that date. Oh, okay. I'm looking at my my old copy here. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. That, thanks. That's correct, Andre. So you just explained it, and Aaron has put up the motion. So everybody was, uh, we had a majority on that one. So now I'm looking for a but, motion. No, we didn't have a vote. We didn't vote. Yeah, we, we, we there was did a motion the, mo and we a did second, the motion. But there was now no we vote. need to vote. Yep. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> All right. You're up. Bruce. Michelle. Hi. <laughs> Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Alex. I'll move to Laura. Aye. Alex, you there? We can't hear you. I'm an I. Do we need Alex? Nope, oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Alex and I. Okay, thank you. Now moving on to the second motion. I move to issue a continuation of the public hearing for lot 13 Olympia Drive, DEP number 8089-0718 to 7.30 p.m. or 7.35 p.m. on 4-10-2024. I second it. Andre on the motion, Bruce on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex has a thumbs up. Aye. Um, Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Well, there's that. Okay, next up. All right, this is of a notice of intent. Um, this hearing, this public hearing is now called to order. The hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in article 3.31 wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. And this is notice of intent for Berkshire Design Group on behalf of Emily Dickinson Museum for the construction of a historic carriage house and associated site work in the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands at 214 Main Street, map 14B, lot 26. So I realize some of you went on a site visit and thank you for those who are able to attend. Bruce, is that a question? I was the site visitor. Sorry? He said he was the site, he was the, the sole commissioner who visited the site. We appreciate that, Bruce. Um, so there is an issue with this one in that the abutters were not notified. So um, because of that, we are we asked them to please continue so that there would be proper abutter notification for this. Um, I don't think we need to discuss this tonight. 
Um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand. But I think other than that, we're looking for a continuation. I move to issue a continuation for public comment for public hearing for 214 Main Street, DEP number 089-0733 to 32724 at 7.30 p.m. Second. Motion by Alex. I think that was a second by Bruce. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Laura? Aye. Right. And I'm an aye. Okay. Next up. This public hearing is now called to order. The hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. This is a request for determination of applicability for Cold Springs Environmental on behalf of Charles and Anne Shu for the instruction for the construction of an addition to existing fa single family home in the buffer zone to an intermittent stream at 23 Ash Lane, map 18B lot 112. And I think we have some representatives here. I'm gonna bring them in. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hello, Alan. Greetings, Alan here. Um, yeah, I'll just make one quick uh, change there and that it is Cold Spring Environmental Inc., not Cold Springs, but minor. I just make the record show the truth. Um, so yes, this is for a, sing a small addition on the back of the single, an existing single family home, uh, 23 Ash Lane and um, Map 8. 18B, lot 112. Um, we have submitted all the paperwork for butter notification. We have submitted all the plan, description of project, the forms. Um, DEP has been copied. Um, we've been out to the site a few days ago. Um, looks like to me, everything is in order. Um, I defer to the commission. Thank you, Alan. Aaron, do you want to give us a some background? I would just add there's a 50 foot offset as required uh, for this with no work zone delineated and the square footages of the work zone, square footages of the entire lot and square footage of the total disturbed area within the buffer zone are all noted on the plan. Thanks, Alan. And if there's any public comment on this, please just raise your hand as we talk so I can see that in a timely manner. All right, Erin, can you give us a summary? Sure. Um, so I I did um, provide the commission with a, a memo, um, which kind of summarizes for all of the um, hearings tonight, uh, my staff comments. Um, but uh, there, I did have a, a couple comments on this one um they were relatively minor um regarding um well i was concerned as to whether there was any bvw on the bank of the stream um and i can show you site photographs uh that their their the bank of the stream is very steep and there was no bvw on the on the banks so that was satisfied um there were, I was concerned about the um, drainage coming off the structure, how it was being handled. They're gonna be putting in um, gutters and downspouts. Um, there are, uh, I was concerned about the um, stockpiling of material and, and if it was gonna be done on site and where, uh, they're gonna be taking the material directly off site. Um, I think those were my core comments. I don't know if I missed any, um, but felt pretty comfortable with the proposal. Just going to share some photos here. So this is facing the back end of the house where the addition would be um, placed on the back of the garage with sort of a slight overhang um, coming out towards where I was standing. Um, looking in this direction towards the back of the house, towards the road. Um, and then if you walk directly back um, from the house, um, you come, you go up a berm, 
Um, and then there's a very steep drop off down to this river. And you can see it's just, it's a, it's a straight drop down to the river. But there is this berm in between the river and the proposed addition, which I, I do think um, uh, provides some, some potential protection to the resource because the runoff from the addition is not going to be flowing uphill towards the towards the stream. Um, the other question that I did have was about whether there was going to be any dewatering necessary for the foundation and Alan seemed to think that the groundwater table was high enough at the site location that dewatering was not going to be necessary. You mean low um, enough? Low enough. I'm sorry, low enough, excuse <laughs> me. Um, so based on this, I drafted um, uh, a motion for um, a positive determination under our local wetlands bylaw and negative determination under WPA with special conditions, which were pretty standard for a single family home. Um, I'll pull up the plan so that folks can see that as well. I apologize, I'm jumping around on multiple screens, so it's a little um, confusing going back and forth. I'll pull this up so you can see, and I will zoom in. It's just going to take me a second. While she's doing that, Bruce, do you want to ask a question? Uh, no, I was just going to concur with what she said. Um, I was out there with on the site visit, and the photograph doesn't do justice to the steepness of the slope. Yeah, I saw that picture and was concerned, but... Um... Aaron explained the berm and the separation of uh, hydrology between the proposed addition and that slope. So that was. Um... If I could add, um, that is why I asked them for a complete topographic site uh, to, uh, by the surveyor. Um, as you know, once I did the um, review of the the resource boundary. The other piece that I just asked Alan for was an accounting of the total um, buffer zone alteration in association with the addition, which um, Alan calculated as putting the site at 17%. So they're under the 20% threshold um, in the wetland regulations. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, commissioners, any comments, questions? Seeing none, I'm seeing no public comment. Well then, I move to close the public hearing and issue a positive determination of applicability checking box five, bylaw and regulations jurisdictional and a negative determination of applicability checking box three, buffer zone only under WPA with conditions. Second. Bruce on the motion, Alex on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Good night. See you later. Good night. Okay. Next up, um, this is our NOI for Karen Environmental Consulting LLC on behalf of LLC Fornax LS. Uh, LLSE Fornax LLC and WD Coles Incorporated for the construction of a battery storage system associated access road improvements and stormwater management within the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands on Montague Road, Route 63, Map 2A, Lot 18. And I see we have Eric. There he is. So if it's okay, I'd like to do just a quick staff update. Um, yes, please go ahead. Okay. So um, I initiated a, a pre-permitting meeting with the applicant as well as multiple town departments uh, so that we could all get on the same page with permitting requirements with other departments in town. Um, that meeting went very well. Uh, I think Alec, uh, excuse me, Eric got the guidance that he needed um, in order to basically, you know, move forward and and proceed with his other permits from other departments. I think the the one area that we arrived at, which um, Eric would like to get some guidance on before he proceeds with the other permits and revisions that are going to be necessary for the town of Amherst that he get a read from the Conservation Commission about whether they're willing to consider 
um, waivers to the 50 foot um, no disturb buffer and the 75 foot no structure zone that is in our uh, wetland bylaw regulations. And so we were hoping that the content of the conversation tonight could be discussing specifically those waivers and whether the commission is willing to consider them. And if the um, if the commission is willing to consider them, then then Eric will know sort of what revisions he needs to make moving forward. Um, and otherwise, what what sort of the plan will be moving forward. So that's kind of where things stand from a staff standpoint. And if I missed anything, Eric, please feel free to um, correct anything or add anything. Thanks, Aaron. Eric, go ahead. Anything? Um, no, thanks for the, the summary, Aaron. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, we, we had a productive meeting. I think since we last spoke, we also had the site visit um, or I guess Aaron, maybe you and in, in the uh, in Miss Labe here had a site visit uh, just to get other commission members to visit the site. Um, and then yeah, we're we're really looking for guidance. I, it's a tricky situation, as you guys know, because we're involved with um, the commission and uh, the fire department and the zoning board of appeals. Um, I don't think it's you know really necessary to kind of rehash the process that we've been through, but of course we went to the ZBA first and. They directed us to come here and now CONCOM has, uh, you know, is asking for input from the fire department. So uh, Aaron's correct. We're, we're looking for guidance from the commission um, on, you know, what, what the anticipated ruling would be uh, just because it's one of the more subjective, I think, uh, determinations that we would um, be pursuing with the Zoning Board of Appeals and the fire department. I imagine it's a little bit more of a a technical analysis and we're in a little bit of a catch-22 where we don't want to go through a full-blown technical analysis with those groups if we uh, don't, I guess, have the approval to cite the project and the location in the first place. Um, so I'm happy to speak to the project in any capacity that I can and and basically kind of inch forward here. Thanks, Eric. Uh, if there's any public comment on this, please raise your hand. I'm going to keep an eye on the room. Um, Commissioners, questions and comments. Are you asking for a show of hands? From you guys, yes. Just if you have a question or comment. Could I just add one quick, uh, a couple quick pieces of information before we go to the next step? In your folder, um, there's a couple additional pieces of information that Eric has submitted to us since the last hearing. One is um, Eversource documentation basically that identifies that Eversource would not allow them to put the um, battery storage facility within the existing solar um, previously determined location within the solar facility. So that basically documents what the issue is with the um, point of interconnection and the um, battery storage facility needing to be within that line of sight. The other piece of information which um, was clarified by the applicant is, and this is something that's kind of been, um, I guess, confusing as we review this. Um, my understanding is that the that this battery storage facility and the solar facility facility are tied together. They are not completely separate projects. There was a an engineering diagram that was provided by Lodestar to our electrical inspector. And based on that diagram, the electrical inspector does believe that they're tied together. She wants to spend a little more time um, evaluating it, but that was the initial got the initial response I got from her, just confirming that it appears they're tied together, and that's coming from the applicant as well. So I wanted to make sure that those key pieces of information were um, in front of you. And also the other key piece of information was the applicant did attempt to submit to ZBA, but they were told not to submit to ZBA until they had already come through conservation um, to get a read on whether the project was approvable. So that's why there's not a tandem track filing going on with the zoning board. Sorry, thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Alex. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's relevant whether they're tied together or not. It was my impression from the site visit and talking with um, Eric at the time that there's no connection between the solar project because what they're going to do is take electricity off the line, store it, and sell it back. 
nothing comes from the solar project to the batteries. I don't need to get into a discussion about that, but that's my understanding. And if we're going to have, be asked if how we stand on the waiver, I just want to ask for those who were not on the site visit, if they understand the project and where it's located and, um, and it's some semblance of what the fire department would require. And I'll just review that the access road that currently exists is fine for Eversource to turn around their trucks, but it's not fine for a fire truck. And the fire truck needs a, a two point turnaround. I'm not sure whether that's allowable under the, in the Eversource easement where the existing road is or whether Eversource would require it to be outside the easement. And maybe Eric can address that. But if we're going to be asked where we stand on the waiver, I hope that those who have not seen the site are clear and understand it. Thanks, Alex. Eric, I see your hand up. You probably really want to answer that. Um, but okay. specifically, can you address the easement and the potential of citing the turnaround in the existing easement? But go ahead. So I'd want to take those two, but first kind of address. Um, I didn't accurately describe how the solar facility and the battery facility were tied in together. And I'm not an electrical engineer at the end of the day. So I was taking my knowledge of how batteries operate and, and trying to explain that the best I could. Um, this project is really interesting and, and not to you know dive into this too deeply, but there's really two main types of batteries. Um, there's DC coupled batteries where um, a solar facility will charge a battery directly before it's inverted to AC power, which the electric grid uses. Um, and then there's AC coupled batteries and those batteries often charge from the grid um, and then sell back to the grid without ever entering into a different phase of direct current for DC. What this battery does is it actually stores power generated from the facility um, in alternating current in AC. So it's a little bit of a unique uh, scheme of charging the battery. Um, generally, batteries that store AC power aren't charged by solar facilities um, because there's a bunch of technical reasons why, and it's a little um, more complex than it needs to be. Um, and also just the physical location of it. So that I, I'm kind of responsible for knowing that, and that's my fault for um, you know not explaining that properly, but it is an AC coupled battery that is charged from the solar facility directly, and it doesn't charge from the, um, the power lines or the electric grid. Um, so I just wanted to clearly state that. And the second thing about the fire department's um, turnaround. So I don't believe that we can use Eversource's easement for um, emergency access. However, I was reviewing the plans and any need to increase um, the access road turnaround that we're currently showing in the site plan to change the angle of the turnaround, any of that is actually outside of the 100 foot buffer for, um, from the wetland. So although I understand the commission's desire to get approval from the fire department before making a decision, if there is a modification to the access road that we're currently proposing, it likely wouldn't be a modification within commission's jurisdiction because it's not within 100 feet of the wetland buffer or the wetland itself. Good to know, thank you. Uh, Laura, go ahead. Well, he didn't answer part of my question, excuse me. Okay. I'm um, sorry. So what was in that? terms of why is this relevant to the decision that we have to make, why is it relevant whether it's connected to the solar project or not? I don't think it is, and I, I'm not sure we should spend more time on it. Um, it's and, interesting to know, though. <laughs> it, so it it is relevant because when we received our special permit for the solar facility um, several years ago, the battery storage project was approved via amended special permit. So that is, it was approved as an additional use to what was approved at the site. So, in, a, in a different location. Correct, but it's it's essentially an amendment to an amended permit, which initially allowed for the battery to be cited and co-located with the solar system. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. All right, Laura, go ahead. I think Jason, Jason, were you next? Do you wanna just no. go? Okay, so I'm gonna go. Um, so my thoughts are, um, first of all, I appreciate you guys coming back here 
Um, and, you know, recalling the presentation last time, you know, I can certainly appreciate going through the pains of getting something cited and going the entire process and then have utility sort of change the goalpost on you after, you know, all this work has been done, approval sought, you know, they're basically ready to go. Um, and based on our last meeting, um, it seemed as though that the impacted area was um, minimal. I have to pull up my notes, um, was, was minimal. And then I think the question that you asked Alex sort of indirectly about fire approval, if there was any changes to the easement access area, it would come back to this commission for approval. Um, so, I mean, I think I can I can appreciate why um, Lodestar, it seems as though everyone in this community, because battery storage is fairly new, wants to push it to everybody else to make a decision. Um, and I think the question is, you know, appreciating that this group has, you know, uh, gone through all of our processes in Amherst, that they are more that they were not responsible for um, the, the changes by Eversource, the interconnection point, which is really important. Um, do we feel comfortable saying you're going to go through all the rigor of all the other committees, you know, you're not going to get hung back up here unless there's further changes to the, uh, you know, the uh, impacted site. So I would be comfortable saying that, um, but, you know, that's just, you know, I just want to put that out there. Thanks, Sarah. Jason? Yeah, so I know we just talked about the whether or not it's connected and is is the connection like a physical connection? Is there trenching? Is there underground utility from from the actual solar panel farm to the battery? Or is it through the wire? Because if there is, and, and I ask this just because I don't see any kind of physical connection from the battery towards the solar array. So is that work that is not currently shown? Is that a connection that's already, like, is it stubbed out somewhere? Or would that be a new physical connection? Or is it connected up at the pole and then coming down wires that would be in that underground trench that uh, we've discussed previously, and that's how it's going to be connected? And then secondly, you mentioned that if the access road were to be widened, it would not be within the 100-foot buffer. Um, I don't really see too many other places where it potentially could be, uh, just looking at this site plan here. Is that something that you all have already figured out where you would widen that and how you would do that? And if so, can you describe that now? And if not, I would just say, I, I you know, I, I repeat, I don't see very many places where that could occur outside of the 100 foot buffer. And I am looking at uh, sheet four of six. But Jason, can I just ask, are we, is there a, a plan? Are we re revising a plan at this point? Or are we just thinking ahead to the future? Well, you know? I mean, for the for the physical connection, if that's no, no, for the is, access road, the access road, uh, for the access road, no, it's, it was a statement, and I just I'm seeking clarification on the statement. I'm also interested in that because they're asking for a waiver, and I'd like to know the like holistic perspective of this project, and if you know they're coming back, which sometimes happens, and we've already made a decision based on certain criteria, everything becomes sort of moot. Um, go ahead, Eric. Sure. Um, so I appreciate you following along in the site plan. Uh, I I like the aerial. It just is such a busy site plan that I don't think it is going to show you what you're looking for. Um, if you go to sheet three of six, I can speak to your question about a physical connection first. Um, and then part of me, again, if I manage to forget to answer all of the questions, but uh, I'll do my best to keep track. So on page three of six, uh, you'll see where we are showing a proposed new PV customer poll. It's um, it's kind of the first poll in the, yep, in the um, kind of like top, or I guess middle right of the screen. Um, there's a call out for it. And just to the west of that, in kind of a very small font, there is a underground line, um, which is running from the existing solar facility northbound to the existing interconnection equipment and utility poles that are on site today. 
what is happening is we are uh, proposing to have basically the power is being routed from the solar facility on the eastern side of the parcel through this underground electric line that already exists. What is happening is before it actually hits Eversource's meter, it can be sent via the mid-span junction pole to the ESS meter pole. And then the power would be routed southbound along, or I guess across this overhead electric line from the ESS meter pole to the ESS customer riser pole. At which point it goes underground, and that's the trenching that we were discussing, to the actual battery, battery facility. So this is kind of the complexity with the um, AC coupled nature of a battery, but also being behind the meter. Um, the, so the AC power is routed from the solar facility and the battery has the ability to catch it right before it spins Eversource's, uh, Eversource's meter. So I, I just kind of want to pause there and, and ask if I address that question. Yes. Okay. Um, and then uh, your second question was on the flexibility with the access road. And if we needed to change it, how would we? Uh, so sheet four of six in the site plan best shows this just because we're closer to the actual turnaround. Um, and what I was trying to describe was not the actual location of how the access road um, starts heading southeast to the battery. But I'm saying in the event that the fire department requires a different angle for that hammerhead turnaround, um, I know that they have to do a turn study and, and I don't know the exact name, but if they needed to widen the access road, it would likely be a marginal increase into the uh, disturbance within the 50 to 100 foot wetland buffer zone. And the actual end of the turnaround where there's a call out for a proposed parking space, that's that blue line is the 100 foot buffer. So I'm saying if we needed to take a different angle, if we needed to widen um, the turnaround in that location, it wouldn't necessarily impact, it wouldn't be an additional impact in the weather there. And we wouldn't get into the 200 foot riverfront? No, the 200 foot riverfront is the, I guess, teal. Uh, mm -hmm. if I know my color is correctly, the light blue. Uh, so we have that kind of like a, a separation there. So you'd really have to like, I guess, double the width of the access road to really encroach on that area. Um, not not saying that I know what the final result is going to be. I'm just trying to point to the flexibility that we have without increasing disturbance. Okay. Um, okay, that was question two. Did, <laughs> did I answer uh, all the questions you had? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, Eric. Um, I've lost track. Um, Andre, go ahead, Andre. Yes, I know that. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for the explanation so far. Um, I uh, I have to apologize. I'm not clear on what it is that you are looking for in terms of waivers. Okay, um, so we are looking for a waiver of, I think there's a no, no improvements within the 50 foot buffer of the wetland itself. And then I believe there's also an additional requirement on page 53 of your wetlands regulations that um, there also has to be a setback for new buildings. Um, although I'm not sure how this is defined um, to be defined as a utility, and then I wouldn't be asking for that second waiver because there's not a, an additional setback for that use. Um, if you're defining it as a building, then I'm also asking for a setback waiver um, being within 75 feet of a wetland. Thanks, Eric. I'm gonna let Eric, um, Aaron just confirm that one. Yeah, so Sorry, I, I just... have a oh, okay. Yeah, I kind of had a quick follow-up. You said the 50-foot uh, buffer. Can you show me where, um, what part um, you're looking for the waiver for? Sure. Uh, Aaron, can you help me again? Thank you. Um, so there should be a, a kind of like mustard yellow. Yeah. Uh, so that, that yellow line is the 50-foot buffer from the wetland, which mm -hmm. is hugs its southwestern uh, portion of the site. Um, and just so you know, there is, we, we quantified how much of the project is within various areas from the wetland. 
So um, only 11.5% of the proposed project is within 50 feet of the wetland. And the vast majority of the project is actually within the 50 to 100 foot buffer area of the wetland. Um, and that's 70.6% of the project. All right, thank you. Aaron, do you want to step in for a sec? Yeah, so something that Laura asked just made me want to to comment on this. So I and and Eric, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding Speak up, Aaron. Sorry. Um something that Laura asked um sort of triggered me to want to um to bring this up, which is we're not looking to approve the orders of conditions tonight. That's not what we're being asked to do. All we're being asked to do is whether we would consider a waiver of the 50 foot no touch zone for the installation and the 75 foot no structure area. Now, um, my understanding from our meeting with the group was that if, if the commission issues a waiver to um, Lodestar for this project, they would go back and they would do further evaluation and further design changes and they would come back to us with a revision. At that time, they would file concurrently with the Zoning Board of Appeals for their additional amendment that they need to their permit. And then the process would essentially begin concurrently with CONCOM and, and um, uh, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals for their, their joint approval of the project. So I just wanted to clarify that because the way it was made to, was that we were looking for an overall approval of the permit tonight and that they were going to have to come back to us to like amend the permit. And they're, they are going to have to make some revisions to this plan before they get their order of conditions. I think that that's their intention here because they don't want to have to come back to us to amend this permit later. They would like to make all the required revisions that the town is looking for, get it on a final plan, and then get it approved. That's my understanding. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Thanks, Aaron. Bruce? Well, I guess my question was similar to what Aaron Speak up, Bruce. Speak up. I think my question had to do with what Aaron just said, but I'll say it a slightly different way. Assume that we give this these two waivers. Under what conditions can we revisit it? Or at what point in the process do we have further uh, jurisdictional control over what happens if we give these waivers? Or does it stop the, our, it doesn't stop our involvement, but it's, it, it prevents us from doing anything down the road? No, we still, you know, we still approve plans and discuss the plans. So I think this is just us giving a go ahead or here's what we need on the waiver tonight. Yeah, is that, yes. So what I thought I heard from Eric was they were just trying to get an understanding of whether we would be inclined to give them a waiver down the road, not tonight. Correct. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. Alex. To move us right along, I'll just say that I don't favor the waiver. And the reason is precedent, number one. Um, I think it's 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 unfortunate the position that the project's in, but I'm concerned about the precedent. Um, we got the 50 foot line involved. The project is one almost 100 percent within the 50 foot buffer. I mean the 100 foot buffer. Our wetland regs say that anything inside the 100 foot buffer causes damage to the wetland. And um, I I would not favor it. Thanks, Alex. Laura? So I think this is an interesting point um, that I had a different comment, but that Alex brings up. When we approved the original project, Aaron, I think it's interesting, you know, when we talk about precedent, I think it's gonna be important to really look at precedent, um, not just the precedent we're setting, but the precedent that we've done in the past that had, you know, actions that we've undertaken in the past, when in good faith, people, you know, do their best, follow the rules, and then things change that are outside of their control. Um, and I would really be interested in knowing in the past, you know, because I certainly have examples of my time on the commission, 
when certain exceptions have been made within reason um, to allow certain projects to go through. So, and I think Aaron, you might not have the answer for this right now, but um, Alex, when I heard your comment, it was more like setting precedent for battery storage in the future and what, or what anything in the future, as opposed to looking back at what we have done before and where we have or have not given approval in similar situations. So that that would be something I would also be interested in. But I certainly have sympathy for the developer um, after having given after having gone through the steps and getting approval. Um, I just think we need to, you know, I mean, I, I think it we owe it to, and maybe we can't make the decision tonight, but we certainly owe it to um to the group to be able to say, hey, if you come back to us again and your design is exactly the same, we're not going to let you through, you know, because that's, you know, as opposed to, hey, we'd consider it. So anyways, thanks for your patience, Michelle. We're like way over, I know. Andre, go ahead. And I do have my own comments. So this is, this is it before I talk. Okay, go. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I, I'm just going to point to, uh, point to the, the the purpose behind um the regulation and the purpose behind the regulation is to protect the wetlands and uh, it just seems like uh, uh within if, w when you're within you know so in other words the uh we have on one hand we have uh the precedent and the precedent and the fact that uh as eric mentioned we uh this was and so did laura this was approved previously but at this, you know, on the other hand, though we have uh, we have uh, the fifty foot uh, no disturb uh, zone and the uh, hundred foot uh, buffer that uh, that are going to be um, affected, and so I, I'm not, you know, I don't, I I think um, I just don't uh, think that the fact that uh, we approved it previously with uh, with it uh, under a slightly different plan uh, is a good enough reason to uh, to approve it now. Um, that's just my opinion, uh, but that's where I'm I'm on the fence as far as a uh, approving a waiver, but I I'm not convinced. That's what Aaron, can you clarify ex like the difference between the previously approved um, Plan. So where is the previously approved plan coming from? Because there was no previously approved plan for this. This is the first time this is coming to CONCOM, this battery storage. I just want to, I'll give you another snapshot of the history. It, yeah. There was, there was a solar facility that was Correct. permitted by the Conservation yeah. Commission. There were, there were, there was an order of conditions that governed that, that, um, solar facility. There was a certificate of compliance issued on that. So that facility was constructed. The applicant went to the zoning board to get approval for this these battery storage several years ago that battery storage that had been previously approved by the zoning board was approved outside of concom jurisdiction so there was no no decision of the concom associated with that because it was out of concom jurisdiction then they got denied by eversource for the interconnection of that proposed project which is why they had to relocate it closer to um the interconnection point on Montague Road. So the commission has not previously reviewed or approved this battery storage. I just want to make that clear. That was a different body. Well, can I just uh, say something now then? I would appreciate not having that misrepresented in the future as having been approved previously by us. Because that's what it sounded like. By yeah, from, from who, Eric, who made... And Eric did, and I think Laura might have. So, yeah, I think yeah, so. It's, it's, let's not yeah. let's not let's let's not uh, mix uh, apples and oranges here. Yeah, I agree, Andre. Okay, thank you. Uh, did we did we, um, Aaron? I thought we looked at this as a solar. I thought we looked at this site before. This there was a a solar just solely solar facility that was there was an order of conditions issued. The solar facility was constructed, and there was a certificate of compliance issued for the solar facility. There was no battery storage associated with that. That came in later outside of jurisdiction, and that was reviewed by ZBA and approved by ZBA. That is this project, but it did not come through CONCOM. Got it. Okay. 
All right, clear. Thank you for working that out. Go ahead, Eric, but perhaps quickly. Yeah, Ed, sorry. I, I just, if I misrepresented, misrepresented the project, that's my bad. I've been referring to the town uh, it, as, a, as a proper noun pretty widely. Um, Aaron has explained it correctly, and I, I wasn't trying to do anything other than what she was saying. Um, it was never our intention to cite a project in the wetlands. I, I think that would be a pretty terrible thing to do from the get-go is to try to develop a project in an area that you don't have express approval to do. Um, we cited the project outside the wetlands, receive, it, it, and we received an agreement with Eversource saying that we could build the project, construct it, and connect it. And it was only a year later that after we received our approvals from the town, not from the CONCOM, but from the ZBA, that they broke their agreement. And it was a year and a half that we went to the Department of Utilities, uh, of Public Utilities, and actually had a, a case about this because you can't approve a project and have it an agreement and have a developer go through all these steps just to backtrack. So that is the reason why the project is in this location. It was never our intention. And I understand that we're requesting waivers just to note you know, I, I'm not coming in here asking for, you know, waivers and thinking I'm going to, I'm going to leave. I'm trying to also propose mitigation that would uh, be sufficient to the commission to consider uh, on the basis of granting the waiver. And that's the phase of species management that we're trying to propose. I think what my company is trying to do here is we're trying to, we're in a tough spot and we're trying to come to the commission and say, what can we do? We understand that we're in a, a weird spot. What can we do to make you feel that this, what we're proposing is sufficient in order to grant us the waiver and, and kind of approve this project that has been years in the making? So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Eric. And it is unfortunate that it's come to our table and that now this has become a CONCOM issue. And um, we appreciate that hardship that you've gone through. Our our charge is the wetlands mm -hmm. and um, it's to uphold that law. So it's not necessarily about how we feel about it. It's a bit of an evaluation about what the impact of the wetlands is going to be if that's acceptable under our bylaws. And so I, unfortunately, our, our site visit didn't work out. Um, I really wanted to get out there because one thing I haven't been able to see is what is the current wetland function? Is it completely degraded by Eversource? I mean, what, and I would appreciate some input from anyone that was able to get out there. Um, is it native in functioning? And like, what is the proper, what is the impact? And then we very briefly touched on what the mitigation would be. And for me, even to consider personally, a waiver, I would have to see some sort of very serious mitigation plan that would be in place in perpetuity that would uh, basically lift this site up on site and um, compensate for any perpetual Im uh, impacts to the to the area that you're going mm -hmm. to be would propose to build on and a three year mitigation plan in a place that has like constant invasive species seed removal and constant disturbance from Eversource is a challenging is a challenging site and i just really want to get out there and see what the proposal is what you know i think what i um i can't find it but i think that the current plan is sort of a donut around the site and that's just not that's really not a great design for mitigation. Um, it's in a in a way that's gonna for you know years and years and years out. That's just leaving it open to a lot of fragmentation and a lot of impacts and a lot of disturbance. So personally, for me, as far as evaluating the wetland impacts, I'd really like to see a more comprehensive mitigation plan to even think about that. Um, and I'm also thinking about that in the context of like an alternatives analysis, like. Where else does the battery go? Like, do you cut down a forest and put the batteries up? Or is this an ideal site to site something like this? Which, not in our jurisdiction, but important to have as far as, you know, climate change, sustainability, alternative energies. So that is something I'm thinking about and in the back of my mind is the alternatives. Um, but I do really want to get out there. And I am interested in commissioners' perspectives on what you saw. And I would like to see more of a comprehensive um and thought out uh, plan that, and, and you know, something that we have some back and forth on for the mitigation. So that's just my perspective that I've been holding back this half an hour. I see some comments. Go ahead, Bruce. 
So I was on the site visit and my concern is less about what I saw than the discussions with the fire captain, because it seems to me that the issue about their access and the, the kinds of, of road that they are gonna require is, it feels very unclear or uncertain as to what that endpoint is gonna be. And given that, then I don't feel reassured that the, uh, the limited amount of, of, um, of uh, engagement with the resource is would hold necessarily. So, you know, leaning one way or the other, I'm, I'm, Eric is asking for an understanding of where we are so he can figure out with his team what to do. And I'm leaning not very happy about the way uh, the uncertainties involved here. And that, and I can't be more specific than that, but that's where Thanks, I am. Bruce. The road keeps coming up and I'm, it doesn't seem to be getting resolved, but I'm wondering if we could continue this discussion pending another site walk. Um, I don't know, Alex. Okay. Well, I'll, that's, I, I think, personally would I, like to see it, but go ahead. There's plenty of opportunity to swing by and, you know, maybe Aaron can join you. I'd join you. There is actually not that many opportunities. <laughs> well, I'm I'm available if you want to go see it. I can tell you that the access road that Eversource has goes right down their their uh, easement, and it's wide enough for a truck or a vehicle, not two passing each other. It's fairly narrow, and at the end there is room for a typical Eversource truck to turn around in a three point turn. It doesn't go off the easement down into the wetland at all. So I don't think that the development by Eversource in terms of the access road has degraded the wetland at all. Um, but with all due respect, Michelle, he's asking for a thumbs up or a thumbs down. He wants to know whether to spend more money or not. And what you're proposing is for him to spend more money. Yeah, well, I'm not ready to say yes on a waiver until I have more information. And one of those things was a site walk, which just scheduling didn't work out and our visit was canceled. But um, I don't know. It doesn't look like you're ready to move forward with a yes on a waiver either. I so am. You are? Yeah. Okay, that's a change. Um, Wait, uh, just to clarify, the question was asking Alex if Alex was willing to issue a waiver. No, I'm not. Right. Okay. I just want to make sure I that am, was clear. I am willing to put the question to the commission. Right. Okay. Well, what Eric think is we... asking and what appears to be happening is a postponement of a decision, which is not what Eric came here for. So could we do a poll and just see who's in favor of the um waiver and who's not and and just do it that way to give eric some read of the board and then maybe eric can make a decision if he'd like to do a site walk and have that offer more information to the remaining commissioners who haven't been to the site yeah so the question being if we are to vote right now are you willing to issue a waiver and that is with no further information and so if yes you're able to issue a waiver with the information we have, please raise your hand. Sorry, a waiver of the fifth. So the to build within the fifty foot, no disturb, and whatever other waiver is required. So, so I think it's building within the seventy five and impacts within the fifty encroachment in the fifty, no disturb buffer. So before we have a hand raise, if yeah. I could, um, I just want to be clear that I'm trying to be courteous to Craig. I mean to Eric who came to us with a question. And so my saying what I what I did is trying to be courteous to why yeah. he came here tonight. That's it. So Eric, I think if you, my gut, we can take the poll, is that if you're asking people to vote, if we could give you a waiver tonight, you're going to get a hard no from everyone without more information. But if you, if you, so if you want to push it, I mean, I think we can all, I mean, that's my sense, but um you know, I don't know. Was that your intention to say? I mean, this is just a hand vote. So this is yeah. sort of the mood of the sure. crowd. We're not going to make anything official. But if you'd like to know where we stand, we can do that. Yeah, I, I'd like to know where you stand. Um, and I've heard some concerns that I'm hoping to address in the event that 
I don't get enough thumbs up tonight. Okay. All right. So the question to the commissioners with hand vote is, are you willing to issue a waiver for, is it the 75 foot no building, Aaron, and then encroachment on the 50 foot no disturb buffer for this project, given the information we currently have? Hands up if yes to the waiver. Okay, so there you have it. I think we need some more information. Do you feel like you know what you need to come back to us on? I think the road is a big one. I think the site visit is going to be one, and I'd really like some information on the mitigation plan. Is there anything else that we can guidance that we can clearly give him so that he can be productive in this? Go ahead, Bruce. Well, this is related, which is where is a motion to continue the public hearing for another two weeks. And there's no way in two weeks that all these activities and further information are going to be achieved. So my, at least at a minimum, we should figure out if we're going to continue the public hearing to what date are we doing that? Okay, we'll get to that. Um, first from commissioners, can you give him some specific feedback that you'd like to hear um, to help you make a vote on this at some later point in time? Uh, Alex. Yeah, I was unclear on the question because the way uh, the question, the, the motion has nothing to do with waiver. Um, but you asked show of hands if people would be willing to issue a waiver given the information. The other side of the coin is where do members stand in terms of denying a waiver? Based I don't on think it. we need, that's the vote that we'll take probably next time. I mean, I'm not ready to vote on that. I and I okay, So maybe I under, misunderstood Eric in the way this whole thing was presented. I thought he was looking for clarity tonight so that he can tell his people uh, where they stand and they can make a decision whether to spend more money or not. And uh, again, I'm just trying to be courteous to him yes. as a business person and not cause them to have to spend more money if we can make a decision tonight. Yeah, thank you, Alex. And I'm sure that's what Eric wanted to walk away with, but <laughs> I'm sorry, Eric. Uh, go ahead, Laura. I would say the other thing. So I think a site walk, I would like to be there too. But, um, and then Aaron, uh, you know, because I, for some reason I must have, um, I like thought we had discussed this project before in a previous version of the CONCOM. So, um, I would really be interested in know, knowing, Aaron, have we given waivers like this before in past business? Um, and we can, you know, we can talk one-on-one -on -one about that and then you can present it to the group. But that's that's something I really would be interested in knowing. Yeah, so I, okay. I can just just very quickly. Yeah. Wait a minute, Aaron. Wait a minute, Aaron. Wait, I... no, let, please let Aaron just answer the question, Alex. I wanted to add to it. Okay, well, go ahead, Aaron. So... Um, in June, on June 22nd of 2022, we updated the wetland bylaw regulations. And so since that time, I don't believe there's been a formal request for a waiver. Um, there have been some, some areas where the commission has, has granted some, some leeway, very small little leeways here and there for various projects, kind of discretionary. But I think the, the scale of this one is a little bit more pronounced and so that's why the waiver request has been submitted but um i can make a list of you know where just even like with beth i mean i'm, I'm maybe actually maybe i'm asking for a data request that's like a mess which i also appreciate so but i like even under beth's term when beth before the previous wetland administrator you know like little things but like what has been what has been issued i just want to make sure we're being fair that's my point um yeah, so it was under a previous bylaw where the setbacks that's were right. different. So that's why I'm saying like previously we had a 35 foot no setback and here we have a 50 foot. So it's kind of comparing apples and oranges, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, all right. Alex, go ahead. I I close out. I'm not going to, uh, what Aaron just said is apple, we're comparing apples and oranges, which is kind of where I was going. No, I'm no, but, but the information from 2022 till now would be relevant. Right. My feeling is we should be looking forward, not back. We've got, we've got climate change is a big issue. We've got uh, a new set of rules. And if you look at uh, the impact on wetlands because of development in Amherst, it's tremendous. We've lost a huge percent 
Yeah, but so Alex, in balance with that is if we've given people permission before, we have to, it is important to act, to act with fairness. So I just, it's data I would like to see. Actually, I think that data would be useful. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, and, but I... and also to keep in mind that every decision we make at every meeting is setting precedent potentially. And so having that history with us would be useful. And also to see how much wetland we've lost. Okay, so everybody, I think... Sorry, Eric, I know you wanted to walk away with more than this, but um, here we are. So um, I think we're looking for a motion to continue. And as Bruce mentioned, we might need more time. Um, Eric, do you have any thoughts on a time period that would be manageable for you? Or do you want to shoot for the state? Um, I mean... So my resources are at the disposal of, um, you know, the commission. So if, if you know, it, if it works for everyone's schedules to have a site visit within the next couple of weeks, and we feel like we can have a productive conversation with the remaining members following that, um, I wouldn't mind continuing this for a couple of weeks. In the event you believe that it would be more difficult to schedule a site visit with the commissioners within um, that period of time, or you don't think that a follow-up meeting so soon would be productive, then I would recommend that we um, we continue the meeting a little bit further. Okay. Since um, a number of commissioners would like to get out there, I'm inclined mm -hmm. to think that we might need more than two weeks. Um, yeah. Alex, I see your hand up. Yeah. Well, is, are you... I'm not clear on the question. Are you asking if we want another site visit? Um, I mean, I know I do, and I, Laura expressed interest in going. Um, so I if think there's, if there's another site visit, I'll go. Okay, great. Uh, the question is, when should we continue this to? And I think that maybe we need more than two weeks just to accommodate that. Whatever. So, er, what does Eric uh, think he needs? He said he'd be flexible given the limitations of the commission's needs. So is this acceptable to you for 10, 24, Eric? Yeah, yeah, that's fine for me. Okay, thank you. All right, looking for a motion on this one. I move to continue the public hearing for Montague Road Battery Storage Project DEP 089 to April 10th, 2024 at 7.40 p.m. Second. Okay, Bruce on the motion. Was that Andre on the second? Yep. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. Jason? Jason? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, thank you, Eric. Thank and you. We'll be in touch. Okay, next up. Abbreviated notice of resource delineation for Peer Sky Development Incorporated on behalf of WD Coles Incorporated, represented by Goddard Consulting for the confirmation of resource area boundaries on site, limited to areas that fall within 100 foot of the proposed solar installation at Shootsbury Road, map 9B, lots 11 and 12, map 90, lot 27. And so we've been requested a, a continuance for this one. Yes. Um, okay. There are materials in the folder so folks can catch up on what's going on offline. Um, there's been some back and forth, but for right now, we'll save time and just continue and we can update at the next meeting. Thanks. Looking for a motion. I move to continue the public hearing for Shootsbury Road and Rad, and Rad to 7.30 p.m. on April 10th, 2024. I second that. Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Jason? Aye. Laura? Aye. No and I. And Alex is an eye. Sorry, Alex, your camera's off. It threw me for a loop. And Alex is an eye. 
Um, camera's off. No, it's not. Okay, sorry, I just can't see you. Um, all right, notice of intent for Wendell Wetland Services on behalf of Kevin and Mary O'Brien for the construction of a new 1200 square foot single family home and associated site work, work within the riverfront area of Eastman Brook at 260 Levitt Road, map 3A, lots 50. This project is proposed as a riverfront redevelopment project replacing an existing garage and chicken coop structure. So another continuance, but they have submitted a plan as Aaron's shown. So in good faith, they provided materials and they're asking for a continuance and we need to schedule a site walk before we hear this too. The site walk is scheduled okay, okay, um, for, for March 22nd at 3 p.m. just so everybody has it on their calendar. Um, but yeah, just looking for a continuation and the materials are in the folder tonight. Um, they were just submitted on what Monday, so we didn't have an adequate time to review them prior to tonight's meeting. Looking for a motion. Uh, I have a question. Oh, sorry, Alex, I can't see I you. I believe mm -hmm. March 22 is a Friday. It is. I'm gonna be out of town. Is it, po I really wanna go on this site visit. Is it okay. possible to hold it on another day? Yes. Um, do you want to send me some dates that would work for you? And you could either meet separately with the landowner or we can reschedule to another time that works for you. Can you join me for explanation? Um, you mean have two separate site visits? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. That's fine. I just assume not meet with the landowner by myself. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think either way we can work with you. If you just send me a couple dates that you're uh, you're available in that that end of that week, um, we can figure it out. So it has to be in that week. Well, so um, I'd like I to see it. I yeah, I'd like that. to see it so I can get comments um, for the following week. Uh, but if you know if if it needs oh. to be the following week, that's fine too. Yeah. So that's so not this week, but next week. It's the end of next week. All right. Let's okay. get it offline, though. I'm I just, think. yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what, you know. Okay. I will let you know when I'm available. Okay. But I can pretty much make myself available whenever you are. Except Tuesday mornings. Okay. Um. Thanks for yeah. being available for the site visit, though, Alex. It's appreciated. Um, looking for a motion to continue this one. I move to continue the public hearing for 263 Leverett Road, DEP 89-0728 at 745 p.m. on 327-24. Second that. Alex on the motion, Jason on the second, Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. Jason. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'm an I. Okay. Um, now we're on to other business. So enforcement order. Um, who is able to visit this one? Just curious. Got Bruce. Just Me and Bruce. Bruce. Yeah. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Aaron. All right, Aaron, do you want to give us an update? Yeah, I'm going to try to sum this up really quickly. Um, materials are in your folder. You can see the enforcement order. Um, you can see the photos. I can pull the photos up if you'd li like for me to flash them on the screen. Um, I did a little um, uh, figure to demonstrate the work I I'd like to see completed out on the site. I'm happy to pull that up as well. The bottom line is the site is worse, a lot worse. Um, the measures that they installed didn't stabilize it. It's There's rills and gullies going down into a... Um, uh, a ravine essentially and the, the material is is flowing directly into a stream it's it's not a good situation so I'm basically laying out um, a series of measures that I think are necessary including repairing replacing existing silt fence adding additional silt fence measures adding erosion control blankets um, and hand removal of a significant amount of material um, that was placed there illegally, as well as the material that's washed into the resource area. And that all of that be completed within the next 30 days. 
Um, and that if it's not completed in the next 30 days, that there'll be fines assessed and that we'll be seeking DEP assistance on resolving it. Um, the reason that I'm kind of taking a hard line on this one is because I think it can be completed easily within 30 days. I think it needs to be completed within 30 days. And the damage that's occurring right now is so substantial that it, we need to have an immediate response action to address it. And um, a Band-Aid is not going to work. We we need like um, full, full site um, work to address the situation. Thanks, Aaron. Bruce? Um, so what I also observed was um, Aaron using the power of the persuasion of the applicant's personal interest to try to get this accomplished because there is erosion of other parts of the site that have nothing to do with our resource that are also eroding away. And he and I, I tried to talk about the potential that we're going to get additional heavy rainstorms and that the sooner this get done, the better for the entire property, not just our part. Wow. Thank you for the outreach, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, that looks terrible. Okay. Yeah, I mean, directly into the stream, it's flowing at this point. I think the other point that Aaron made on the site was that the part that's going into the stream is off the applicant's property. It's actually flowing to someone else in addition to the to the to the the stream. And this is a great example of how impacts that are outside of our jurisdiction flow into our jurisdiction. So in this particular case, the entire site was graded towards the resource area which was not part of the site plan. There was supposed to be like a 50 foot buffer in between the resource area and the home construction. And they basically came in there with fill and graded the whole thing back to the wetland um, or to the to the buffer zone. And so everything, and it's the whole site is, is exposed. So everything is washing off of this site down into the buffer and they pushed a huge amount of fill and girdled a bunch of trees um you can see them buried here like several several feet deep um they need to be hand dug out um just it's it's terrible there are the girdled trees in our jurisdiction yeah, or... they're in the buffer so this is like the 100 foot line here there was supposed to be 100 feet or 50 feet between the 100 foot buffer and the house but you can see, I'll, I mean, you can see the water flowing off the site from from above. But I'll, you know, they clear cut between the house and and um, the buffer zone, and so everything's washing from the site down into the buffer. And also, the front of the lot is is um, eroding into the road, which er goes into catch basins and drains into resource area as well. So I'm telling them they have to stabilize the front too because this these catch basins drain to resource area so it's it's kind of taking jurisdiction over the entire site to try to get them to stabilize um the entire site immediately um we don't actually know the status of the trees because the the soil is about this high up on each one okay. for, you know a lot of them and so he and i talked about digging it out by hand carefully to make sure the girdling of the of the uh, bark doesn't happen while they're digging it out. Okay, I want to come back to the tree part, but go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I just, Aaron, you mentioned that the whole you you've you've come up with a plan here, and you've mentioned that the whole site essentially is is graded back towards the resource area. Are we within our are are we able to say you know aside from putting erosion sediment controls down they should have some sort of swale they shouldn't be grading this all the way this shouldn't be draining towards the resource area um so my only concern with that is and and there's a couple ways to go about this with enforcement right we could say cease and desist, you need to file a notice of intent application, in which case they'd have to hire someone to put a plan together to come back before us. That's a huge delay to have them do that. 
my thinking is let's see if we can get them to stabilize the site and we can you know with vegetation and stabilized surfaces we can stop what's going on here at that point the commission can decide okay we want an after the fact notice of intent to install some swales but my thinking is just to get some immediate stabilization measures to stop what's happening and then assess it again um, this is going to be a, a multi-part enforcement situation it's not going to be just a one and done um unless they do these stabilization measures and everything all of a sudden looks you know perfect and there's no other issues um that's the only way i could see it resolved that quickly yeah i mean we're talking about 30 days and we're talking about hand digging out you know however many trees putting down seed mulch erosion control blanket after all of those trees are dug out right right so we're talking you know in in effect you know a few weeks to do that yeah um i know that it, and it's the onus is on the home owner right the property owner but it's the contractor potentially that did this and it's the contractor that's potentially going to come in and fix it um i'm curious do does this project have grading plans on file with the city and yeah so you're looking at the plan town, right now like... this is the this is the approved plan um so you can see where the tree line was supposed to be and where the limit of work was supposed to be is the that tree line rep that's representing the 100 foot buffer this is the 100 foot buffer right here okay um it's cleared clear cut and graded up to this line the entire site has been clear cut and graded up to this line and everything is graded back towards this this rear um buffer zone and a large amount of fill was pushed right up to the to the um top of slope here and that's what's washing down and that material was just pushed over the edge sort of indiscriminately um no stabilization measures with one line of erosion controls um this was the site where the erosion controls were not supposed to be, the erosion controls were supposed to be higher up, but they were placed lower down. And I asked them to move them. Um, when I did the inspection, I said the erosion controls need to be further from the resource area. And the consultant who was representing the client told me no, that that's where they were going to stay. <laughs> and what was ironic is when I was out on the site visit, the owner said to me, why didn't you tell me to move the erosion controls higher up on the slope? And I'm like, I did. <laughs> and your consultant said no. So this is, you know, this is the push and pull that I get caught in. Um, so yeah, it's, it's challenging. Yeah. So, all right. Can, can we move to the, are we through discussing this? Can we move I see on? Andre's hand up. Andre, did you have something? I do. Um, I'm just, Double checking here. Uh, Carl's excavating is uh, has some legal exposure here too, right? Yes. Aaron? Okay. Yeah. All right. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. I had a question about back to the trees because um, <clears throat> this is the same applicant that came to us for removal of trees maybe like a year ago. I think some commissioners might have been on that. And we approved the removal of some trees that were nearer to the house. And then they came back and wanted to remove more trees for view purposes. And we denied that one. Um, and now you're saying that there's some standing girdle trees. And I'm just wondering, is there any relationship there? Are they in an area that they, they, I assume you mean someone took a chainsaw and girdled the trees. Is that what you mean? No, no. I mean, they're oh. buried. Oh, okay. They're buried oh, like three feet deep. Okay, good. I'm glad that it wasn't <laughs> the former. Okay. Uh, were any of those trees, sorry, were any of those trees that were previously denied removed? Yes. Well, yeah. that's a second violation, isn't it? Well, they're, they're out of compliance with their permit period. I mean, they, they did not do what they said they were going to do. They went way beyond what they said they were going to do. They did not follow the plan. So they're out of compliance with the determination that was issued 
Uh, I'm sorry, did I just hear that? Yes, that some of the trees that they uh, were denied before are now have been cut. Not cut, but they've been buried, yeah, which has okay. damaged them. I heard that the same way Andre did. So, mm -hmm. so they did. Okay. Well, I'd like to see what's on what's under that buried uh, area too. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing I was trying to say is that we don't know what's under there until it's if the soil is removed carefully from around it. You won't know the damage or not. Um, we'll see. Okay, Jason. Anything? Uh. Yeah, given so I know that there's a motion out here, but I feel that this is a particularly egregious violation, and I am not in favor of giving them 30 days. Like, I think personally that some sort of monetary fine should be issued and but prior to the, that 30 days, um, if at all possible. So finding is not ideal. Um, it's it's not ideal. And um, I would be happy to have a conversation, Jason, with you offline about it um, for mm -hmm. to explain the reasoning why. Um, we we can issue fines, but it's not as easy as, you know, um, it, as it sounds. So it's it's very complicated. It's got to be done every single day. It's sent to superior court on a daily basis has to be postmarked as well as to we have to keep a copy and send a copy daily to the applicant for every day that the violation exists and then ultimately if they don't pay we have to go to superior court and there are ramifications to that as well so if we can avoid it to the degree we can i would highly recommend that we do just for resource allocation reasons but I do think that we need to tell them and make them aware that if they do not follow this exactly as we've outlined, that that's going to be the next step. Again, you guys can do whatever you want. I just want you to understand the complexity of fining. Okay. All right. So do we, this has been ongoing. I mean, this started last in 2023. This sat yeah. over the entire winter with snow melt, with the heavy rains that we've had, you know, there's definitely been impacts to the to the resource. And like I said, I feel like this is a particularly egregious, um, uh, egregious violation. So, in lieu of a potential fine, you said we can do a cease and desist. Is that essentially a stop work order until all of our all of the conditions are met? No, a cease and desist means they can't do anything on the site, including restoration mitigation activities. So I don't recommend a cease achieve. and desist at this point. Yeah, that doesn't achieve anything for us either. No, it doesn't. I mean, so there's there's multiple options. You tell them what you want them to do and give them a time period to complete it. You make them file a permit or you issue them a cease and desist or any combination. I don't think asking them to file a permit at this point is the right move. It's going to take too long. We need to Im immediate stabilization measures. I also don't think cease and desist is the move because um, if we issue a cease and desist, they're not they're not going to be able to do anything. Um, do yeah. So then, what is the purpose? What is the point of of a cease and desist? And we can talk. We well, can take them offline. I'm just not yeah. sure why. We would ever it's do if that they're thing. in the middle of doing work. It's it, like in a situation like this is not a good example. But it's like if they're in the middle of doing work that where they're they're going out of bounds, you could issue a cease and desist and make them file an after the fact permit as long as there's no resource area alteration happening as a result. Um, it's a just an immediate stop stop measure um, to make them just cease any work on site. Okay. Laura, my question was around the cease and desist. Is there any scenario? So uh, interestingly, this is um, an area that I'm really familiar with. So my kids grew up playing in the stream right down there. It was like, so I'm very familiar with what it used to look like. Um, is there a scenario where you can do a cease and desist and then we bring in contractors to fix the damage and they pay for it? I guess my, my concern is, my only concern is we're going to wait 30 days. Things are not going to be done to the level that we want them to be done to. And then, you know, hopefully something's done, but I mean, is there any, is there ever a scenario where we have the authority to bring in people who 
could, you know, dig out the trees and, you know, do all of that and they foot the bill. No, I mean, at the end of the day, this is private property, so we don't have any rights to enter on their property and do work on their property. It's, you know, it, ultimately they are liable for what's going on, um, but we don't have any rights to to take over the site. Now, if DEP gets involved, that could be a different scenario, um, but for us, it's not. And again, you know, I would... If if there is any lack of cooperation here, I would not hesitate to involve DEP immediately. Um, and I think that's an important um, resource for us to keep in mind in our toolbox. Erin, is there a different vehicle other than the fining um, scenario? Um, <laughs> Can I, I just say? Can I just? Can I just say? Can I? Left. Can I just say something? I've been doing this almost twenty years. This is my recommendation. I, we can okay, talk about I, it all night long, but I just really, this is the solution. Okay. This but is the, the best is, solution we, we never, have ever us. go to fines because of the same reason. And that seems like a problem. And here we are getting this, this problem that's worse and worse. And we have nothing to do about it except the same thing over and over again, which is, you know, hope for compliance. And we all hope for that. But like there has been impacts over like a six month period to the resource area. Is there any way to have a fine that's structured around like a mitigation, uh, you know, not a donation, but like a mandatory mitigation fee? So my recommendation to the commission is once this is done, like this is just step number one, get the site stable. Once the site is stable, my recommendation would be require this applicant to file an after the fact notice of intent to restore and replant and do a mitigation area to compensate for the adverse impacts that have been caused. But I think that's sort of a step number two as part of this enforcement order, um, which I don't think is appropriate at this step. I think at this step, the appropriate thing is immediate urgent stabilization measures with the firm deadline and affirm if this is not done, this is going to be the next step that's spelled out clearly. Um, because I think at this point, that's our best chance to get them to comply. And once they have complied, I think we have more leverage to require additional things of them. Well, should we tie in the mandatory NOI to this motion? I... I would keep them separate if I was you. Um, there's nothing that stops us from amending and updating this enforcement order once they have reached the benchmark of completing the stabilization measures. It doesn't mean that we're done. Um, until the commission says that you're in full compliance, they're not in full compliance. So there, the commission has a lot of discretion here um, to continue to monitor this and add additional requirements until it's to your satisfaction that it's been resolved. Okay, thanks. Well, I think we should keep that in mind in 30 days. Um, Andre. Erin, you mentioned this before and I'm sorry that I didn't, uh, that it's it, it's not, it didn't seat properly in my mind. Um, tell me again, what the recourse is uh, through the DEP, uh, in, if, in you ask, words, if you ask uh, DEP to get involved, you're essentially turning the enforcement over to DEP, which is not my first choice. Any permit that I have, I do not want to turn over to a state agency. I want it to be managed and monitored locally so that I have control to respond, to visit the site, to interact with the landowner if additional measures are necessary. You know, there are three people who work for Western Region wetlands office they're managing everything uh west of worcester so I, I don't particularly want to turn it over to them unless i have to if we do have to we will but i mean that's a again it's a last ditch you know if they're not complying got it thank you alex yeah i'm ready to uh, support erin in the motion that she's prepared and would suggest that we move on that. We still need to discuss Four River School. And, and I'm looking for time to talk about commission issues that we need to schedule. And I would just assume not everybody very tired by the time we talk about that. Too late for that. Okay. 
<laughs> Sorry, but I've got one more. You know, Aaron, I, I agree. You know, I don't want to continually belabor this, but so in these conditions of um, the enforcement order narrative, you stated that all uh, the unpermitted fill, once it's been removed, needs to be stabilized with a biodegradable erosion control blanket and that um, the other areas need to be stabilized with either seed and mulch or hydro seed. What hap once that biodegradable blanket is down, then what? Because that is going to biodegrade. And as we get into the summer months here and it gets humid and it gets wet, it's going to biodegrade fairly quickly, depending on what they use, because we're not calling out a, a we're not specifying the product. So they can, as long as it's biodegradable, they can use whatever they want. Um, if it's straw, it's going to go quick. What then are we going to have them? What What is the permanent uh, solution to this then? Or do we need to write that now? Or can we visit that once we take step number two in this enforcement action? Yeah, so there was a wetland seed mix that was also required to be planted, um, you know, in association with the, you, you know, restoration basically of the area. So, um, I mean, I think there should be seed put down, but then, you know, I think once the blankets are down, once the, you know, seed and mulch are down, er, um, uh, s s improved erosion controls that are actually functioning, I think then our next step is what would the commission like to do? Do you want to see that air, that hillside replanted? If so, we need to specify what plantings to put in um, or have them submit a mitigation plan that's actually created by someone, um, you know, but um, I, totally open to it. I, you know, this, I think April 12th is, is right around the corner. So it gives them some time to address this and then we can, we'll be in the growing season so we can, we can either suggest what we want. We can say, we want you to plant, you know, 10 of these and 20 of those and 15 of those. We can spell it out for them what we want them to do, or we can have them hire someone and file an after the fact permit to do it. Okay. So that'll be part of step two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bruce, you got a motion for us? No. Um, I think in by some mechanism, we should tell him that we're going to have a site visit every week. That's a great idea. Okay. Yeah. I'm in favor. I think that's a great idea. Oversight. Is Erin going to add that? Yeah, I'll add that to the, I'll add that to the. Uh, okay. Notice. So then uh, I will move to update, ratify, and reissue the enforcement order issued to Amir McKechi and Carl's excavating for work at 11 trillion way. As noted in the narrative, all required work to bring the project back into compliance must be completed by April 12th, 2024. If requirements are not met, the commission staff will begin assessing a daily fine of $300 and the Department of Environmental Protection will be consulted for support in resolving this matter. And second. And what would Aaron add? Uh, do we wanna, okay, Jason, do you wanna add the site visit? schedule you, i'm just going to add it into the document it'll be oh, in, yeah okay. it'll this, be in the enforcement is, got it okay who had the second sorry i did Andre, so okay I jason on the motion andre on the second bruce aye jason aye alex aye andre aye laura aye Tom and i okay well see again trillium <laughs> Okay, next up <laughs> is, sorry, did someone say something? <laughs> We're laughing. We're all laughing. <laughs> um, discussion of playground surfacing at Fort River School. Um, okay, so there's been a couple of public comments on this one, and if anybody in the public wants to speak, please raise your hand now and I'll, I'll get to that. Um, okay, so my brief comments, which unfortunately it's quite late at night, but um, I am not going to reiterate everything that the Board of Health uh, deliberated on in their research, but they did do a lot of re research on the most available scientific literature, all of which is emerging on toxins 
in this is crumb rubber, like recycled tire, poured in place, uh, unitary surface. And for those who aren't familiar with it, it's used in playgrounds like Groff Park and um, Kendrick Park because it's bouncy. Um, so it meets safety standards. And um, there's emerging evidence that it has toxicity both to human health and um, ecosystems. And it's in our jurisdiction because there's a stormwater system that will take the outflow from this. And it's, I think, like 13, that was 1,300 feet and into the Fort River, into the um, river buffer. So um, I think from where I am, okay, the other part of this is there is an alternative to this material and it's called, well, there's several alternatives to it. There's an institute at UMass Lowell that's done a lot of research and evaluations of the different playground materials and that was provided to us in some of the public comment and they're basically listed and coded by toxicity. Um, so in this case, we have a material that was proposed by the contractors. We have a, an alternative to the material and the town and the school building commission, the committee is looking to the conservation commission to basically deliberate or make a decision on what is acceptable to us for the playground servicing. Now, before the school building committee came to us, we approved the school building site plan with the exception of the playground plans because we weren't ready to fully deliberate on that. So we don't have that plan in front of us, but in order for them to move forward with the building, they want some guidance from us on what would be acceptable. So I think what we need to do is discuss our concerns, discuss where we stand on it and make a motion on some kind of, uh, just basically make a motion on what our decision and standpoint is. I don't know if it has to be a, a memo or just a motion. I think that's what the Board of Health did. Um, again, they did a lot of research and it's way too late for me to go into this, but if you'd like me to rattle off what the, what the chemicals are and, uh, more of the ecotoxicity, I can do that, but hopefully you guys read some of the summaries that were in your packets. Okay. Um, any questions from commissioners, comments, anything? Can we put a time limit on this discussion? Sure. I'd love to. How about 10 minutes? Dave, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the summary, Michelle. I think, you know, I've had a couple of conversations with the town manager about this. I believe the town manager may have been, I think he was quoted in the newspaper on an article on Fort River School saying that, you know, he he's a member of the, the building committee, the Fort River School Building Committee. And I think he and other members of that committee, as well as the designer are, looking for input, as Michelle mentioned, from the Board of Health, but also from the Commission. Um, I might suggest that you frame this in the form, you mentioned a memo, uh, Michelle, but perhaps a, a recommendation from the Commission in the form of a memo might go to the, the Fort River School Building Committee, as well as the town manager, um, and perhaps the superintendent. So, um, perhaps a recommendation as to, um, I don't think we want to have the commission call out a specific product uh, because, but but something, you know, an alternative to poured in place rubber surface, you know, referring to something made of cork, mm -hmm. you know, that, that kind of recommendation. Um, thanks, Dave. So. I mean, that sounds good to me. I guess my only concern is, is a recommendation a standpoint on which they can, is strong enough to make a decision? Because I did attend the school building committee and Paul was pretty adamant that there needed to be a vote. And I just want, you know, the board of health makes recommendations. We make, we have votes. And I just want it to be clear that if it is a recommendation, whatever that is, that that's a position that, that we're taking or that if they have anything that varies from that, that they need to come back to us with a plan, which we would vote on. So, uh, you know, I, okay, so I've, I have drafted something that I can put up on the screen um, and we can look at it and it's, you know, specific to the Fort River playground and it both includes, uh, can I change, can I share my screen? Yeah, try again, Michelle. Okay. Sometimes it takes a couple times. 
while she's doing that, uh, did I hear that we put down the the crumbly tire material in the park? Uh, yeah. So crumb rubber tire is a recycled tire, and it's in um, Kendrick Park. It's in Groff Park, and I I believe that's what the track is also made of. The track at the high school. Yeah. Yeah, it's very soft, very bouncy, and it also off gases quite a bit, and it gets very hot. And there was, I believe, it's that Kendrick part too, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there was lots of discussion about the high school redoing the track, and went back and forth with the school committee. I'm very surprised that the town put it down in the drain. Yeah. Well, if I could, just to clarify, we have a 20-year-old track. Nothing has happened at the track at the high school. So there is no there is no new track at the high school. No, they've been talking about how to resurface it. Right, right. That's a, a conversation that's still in, in process. That's, out, so, that's outside of this conversation. Yeah, I just don't want to get sidetracked on the, yeah, on the high school track tonight. Andre, go oh, ahead. Can I just say something there? Um, Michelle, uh, to your point, um, you mentioned that uh, the Board of Health has uh, made their recommendation. Um, they made a recommendation, and, and it seems like the idea is still there to continue with the, um, uh, the uh, tire PIP. Um, I don't know why they're continuing with that, uh, but... Um, well, they're an advisory the committee. And we're uh, a regulatory commission, so there's well then, different. Right. So then, my point is that we what we regulate is the is the wetlands and the discharge uh, that could come from the uh, crushed tire PIP, and I'm not uh, I'm not ready to let uh, let a bunch of zinc and uh, and. Uh, lead and so on uh go out into the uh, environment there um so yeah i'm i'm against what they uh have proposed i would be uh certainly happy to see uh some sort of cork even if it's not corking or something else but some sort of alternative um that would be uh safe uh for children and also, by the way, uh, let's make sure that we keep in mind accessibility. Yes. Uh, because there has been some, uh, there has been some uh, voice uh, that the cork may not be accessible or as accessible as the. Uh... No, it, it is. It's like a okay. unitary port in place service, and that's why it's being promoted as the best alternative. And. It's mm -hmm. not as good as the engineered wood. These other ones on the list are sand and pea gravel um, in terms of the you know potential toxicity, but those other ones, those other options are not accessible. So that's why cork is rising to the level yeah. of the best alternative. So, yeah, okay. So then uh, in some of the reading that I've done, it said also about the, uh, about the tire PIP is that, um, that it is considered uh, by ADA uh, accessible if done right. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if there's a uh, um, if there's a, also a uh, some kind of nuance to the uh, cork. I'll leave it at that for me. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, two things. One, I just I do worry a little bit about a motion or a, a requirement of the commission to to use a propri proprietary name like corkine. I'm wondering whether port in place that. unitary surface made of cork might be enough. The second thing is I want to be really careful. We don't, um, I had a conversation with the town manager two and a half, three hours ago, maybe it was four now, because this meeting has been long, um, where I asked him about where the building, the Fort River uh, School Building Committee is with regard to this. And I just want to make sure we don't kind of project where we think they are. Um, I, I do not, I do not believe they are moving, 
I do not believe they 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 are going to move forward with a with a um, put in place rubber surface if the commission doesn't do something tonight. I you know I think you should do what you want to do with this motion if this is a direction you want to go. But I just want to make sure we don't. Yeah, that we don't project what we think they may do, or I don't really think they've said that they will move forward uh, unless the commission does something. I think they're looking for a recommendation from the commission or a vote from the commission. So I just encourage you to do what you feel is right here tonight. Okay. I mean, my impression from that meeting was that they were sort of um, at a point where none of them were really ready to move forward and that they were relying on the commission to sort of make the decision that would push them one way or the other. And so in the interest of not being rate limiting for them, um, you know, this is what I was thinking of doing, which is giving them a sense, just like we did with the battery storage of where we are there um, and to give them a way to move forward if they want to. So mm -hmm. I think there's a, I'm just saying, I think there's a lot of community support for going in this direction. And I think they've heard that. So I think if this is the direction the commission wants to go, then you should, you should do that. Alex. Uh, yeah, just um, um, first a time check, we've got a minute and a half left. It would be nice to know what all alternatives clearly are tonight. And I also agree with Dave that we shouldn't be specifically recommending anything. We don't have the we don't have the expertise to do that. Um, and I'll also, I don't think the discussion with the school board about how to replace the high school track is 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 not germane because all of these kinds of issues have been discussed. Even town council got involved. So what what to put down, which is which is safe, healthy, and so on. This is a continuing conversation that's bounced around for the last six months. So we can learn from that. Um, and maybe the school committee is ready, has heard it, but they certainly pushed back when they were first told that what they were proposing wasn't appropriate for the high school. Um, so, and we had a suggestion of writing a memo Michelle says we need a vote. What are our real alternatives tonight? I mean, we can wait for them to come back with a plan and do nothing. Um, I just, again, sitting in on that meeting, they were kicking the can to us. So here is the can back to them <laughs> with some guidance and you know, they're on an extremely tight time frame on that, and I'm I'm you know cognizant of that, but up for a discussion. I mean, for me, this is an acceptable standpoint, and I'm going to be in the same place when we vote on it or not. So, I'm interested to hear where other commissioners are at with it. Bruce, go ahead. Andre was first. Sorry. <laughs> Andre was first. <laughs> Andre. Oh, I'm not muted yet. Okay. Um, so <laughs> what I wanted to propose is, uh, for one, um, if we let's, you know, if we're familiar enough with, uh, with the topic or have read some, maybe we can take a straw poll to see if we're ready to uh, perhaps make a recommendation. Um, and again, I think the point that uh, Dave was making earlier, Alex, was that we not recommend a specific uh, brand of product, right? Which is what that uh, that corking is. But if we describe a type of product um, that we are looking for as an alternative to um, to the uh, uh, crushed up tire. Uh, then that would uh, that could perhaps be uh, some kind of guidance that they're looking for. Um, so I, I'm I'm looking for to see if we might um, expedite by uh, by seeing if that's something that we're uh, agreeable to, so that we can uh, end our uh, marathon here. 
Thanks, Andre. Bruce, and just so you know, I'm supposed to let everybody talk first one time before I go back to the same person. So go ahead. I'm in favor of what Michelle has up on the screen now. Okay, so why don't we do a straw poll about this? Um, I can't see anybody. So I'm gonna... <laughs> Okay, so um, raise your hand if you are in favor of moving forward with some kind of recommendation tonight or determination tonight. Okay, everybody. All right. Um, does anybody having viewed this have any comments on it or edits to it? And, you know, just to get nitpicky with the words, it's a I use the word determine. I didn't use the word recommend. I didn't use the word vote. And I don't, you know, know legally what the implications of, of that are, but um open to comments on how this is worded so that it's representative or not. But any last contributions on that? Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, the last part says the commission does approve for use. Do we mm -hmm. want to just state specifically that the commission does not approve for use the use of recycled tire poured in place playground surfacing? I mean, I'm okay with that and the simplicity of that. Um, uh, those are just ones that. Um, Is the word approve or recommend? The so the for what part? The I, was thing, gonna, I was going to make come the back same. to us with a plan that yeah. has board in place, recycled tire, board in place. We're not going to approve that. We've already approved the plan, save the playground surfacing. So they need to bring that back to us anyway, correct? So correct. It, That's what I was going to say. Them, I think we ought to tell them right now that if they do that with the recycled tire poured in place, it will not be approved. Yeah, that's kind of where I was trying to go and expedite it. Okay, so Jason's in favor of cutting out the... the. Sorry, not, not cutting that part out, just okay. adding, let's add that we do not approve the use of recycled tire poured in place. We keep the bottom part, we don't take that out. So there's a sentence he's suggesting that comes before the commission. Okay, so it's that uh, so more than the last. Oh, that it comes before the commission. Okay, so I'll read it. the commission determines that there's sufficient evidence of toxicity to water resources resulting from the leaching of the blah blah blah. Uh, prohibit to prohibit the use of the uh, the commission will not approve the use of recycled tired port in place playground surfacing. And could you add and other toxic substances? Um, I feel like that's getting that's I don't know. What if um I don't know toxic? Well, like some of the some of the tissue, some of the materials they wanted to replace the high school with were cancer causing, and um, so. If we're going to talk about the tire, uh, recycled tires, maybe there is a catch-all phrase that that loops in things that are detrimental to, to health. And I don't know if that if we'll find out someday that that's cork, but to me that's that's what we're talking about. It isn't just tires where we don't want toxic materials going into the resource or the, for that matter, outside of our jurisdiction, but children being exposed to it. Yeah, I mean, so cork has a binder in it that's like, I don't know what it is, but it's probably not 
completely inert as much as we'd want it to be. So I don't want to preclude options that are much better than poured in place um, with a statement that is, you know, so exclusive. But other thoughts, welcome. Erin, go ahead. I just want to say the statement, the, the commission approves for use at Fort River Playground because no matter what is no matter what is proposed at Fort River, they have to come back for approval to the CONCOM. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. However, this is phrased that, you know, we're not vote we're not voting on this in an you know in a public hearing, right? Where this is right. this, this is, is guidance. Yeah. yeah, but, yeah. Uh, so I removed record. that and put recommends because I thought that's, that's what people are suggesting. Okay. Yeah. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, I know it's getting late. Just two quick comments. Um, just Alex, just if I could, you keep bringing up the the um, high school, and the issue at the high school that's been discussed with some in some detail is actually not the track and field. It's actually the whether we go with turf or grass. So the 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 track has miraculously not gotten much attention at all. Very few people have talked about what is the surface going to be at the track. We're many, many months away. We just began the design for the track and field. So I just want to make sure we don't kind of mix and match projects. I well, also I might, have, I might have gotten yeah, it was the mostly surface, about the turf. I might have gotten the surface mixed up, Dave, but yeah, the, the yeah, issue is the same. The, the issue is the same. With regard to broadening this, you know, uh, in that last comment, I just want to, I also want to point out that there is going to be a number of acres of bituminous pavement that are going to be part of this project, that all of that pavement is going to leach petroleum for weeks or months after it is laid down. So I would encourage, I like what Michelle has done here, I would encourage the commission to really focus on what is it you're talking about here? What is it your focus? Your focus is uh, the playground surface. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just worry about kind of mission creep here a little bit because we could get sidetracked on a lot of different aspects of the site. You're you're concerned about, you know, um, uh, crumb rubber and and those kind of surfaces. So I think I think you're close, and I I encourage you to kind of move forward with with what what you have. I will also point out that the I know why Michelle included the engineered wood, the sand, and the pea gravel. That may end up on the site, but all three of those are do not meet ADA standards. So, you know, pork is the likely, you know, the best and likely alternative here to port in place surfaces. The other three I don't think will meet ADA, ADA yeah. requirements. Well, there That's was cool. some discussion about um like if the entire surface wasn't cork, that some areas could be filled in with those that wouldn't interfere with like movement so i just with that in yeah. mind i put those as like filler areas or something no you did it's a great it's a great uh the work the work you did is great so yeah. okay thank you um all right so we have a designated area that we're talking about we've made clear the yeses and nos and this is a basically preliminary guidance and they have to come back to us no matter what with what they do so it's not a vote on a plan and this is just helping them move forward in their planning and decision making. Um, okay, any comments? I'm for it. Do we need to make a motion that we send this to them or can we simply just send this? Can we all agree? I see your hand raised, Alex. Yeah, I'm not quite sure where we wound up at the end of Dave's comments uh, about um, engineered wood, sand and pea gravel, leaving that in. And that's yeah. question one, and and or just say something like uh, the commission would support use in the Fort River playground the use of a material such as uh, pork. Or uh, yeah, Alex, I think that if we leave it like that, um, those recommendations are still going in because they would be good, but the uh, they uh, the zone uh the zoning board or someone is going to realize that they're not uh ada uh they're, they're going to make sure that whatever they approve is going to be ada uh, uh compatible or ada approved right okay thanks yeah 
Yeah, um, I think there should be a motion to approve this determination. I move to approve this uh, recommendation. I will second that. Okay, Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. Alumni? Aye. And thank okay. you, for, thank you, Michelle, for the work you did in bringing this forward. That's uh, much appreciated. Okay. Thank you for giving it its due time. <laughs> and I I think you've been waiting to bring something up, Alex, but clearly we're an hour over. So, um, Sorry, did we have to let anybody from the public? Oh, yeah. My screen is, I'm feeling Aaron's challenge here with sharing a screen and not being able to see what's going on. Um, does anyone see any hands up? Because I got my blinders on. There are two attendees. Yeah. Anybody can raise their hand at any time if they've got comments. There's okay, a comment. Tony raised a hand. Okay, Tony. Hi, uh, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm applauding your vote just now. And I've been following the school building committee process since the beginning. And I came away from the last meeting with the same takeaway that Michelle described where the committee was planning on moving ahead with rubber port in place unless the CONCOM uh, said that they would not approve it. So I think this um, motion is really important and I think the language you've used is excellent and I applaud uh, your action on this. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Okay, I'm seeing no other hands up. Um, Alex, was there a specific topic that you wanted to bring to the commission. I'm, I don't think we have time tonight, but I wasn't aware of it. So I've been asking for space on the agenda for well over a month and we had one discussion. All I want to do is identify them. I don't want to talk about them. You want to identify what to talk about? I want to identify things that the commission needs to talk to itself about. Yeah, I agree. That's important. Um, mm -hmm. And so we need to what come up with a list. Was that your I have I have three things, right? And okay. um, I I would recommend that we put them at the beginning of our agenda, not the end when everybody's tired. Can we hear the three things? Yeah, I would like to find a time in the future for the land use subcommittee to bring forward those uh, policy matters for which it has concluded its work, and would like to introduce the finished products to the commission for its consideration and approval. And I don't, that doesn't need to be, I just need to schedule it. Okay. And we have that for the, the I, what, what section do we have? Community gardens? I don't want to talk about it. I just want to put it on the okay. list. Is it prepared enough to do that for the next meeting? Like, so we can circulate materials for everybody to review before the next meeting? No, I'd like to finish agriculture before we have this meeting. Okay. Please continue with your three items. I would like to invite um, Chris Bascom to talk to the commission about fire department requirements for batteries. And I'd like to invite him when we do not have a project in front of us where we have to act on it. And it's not part of a discussion, not part of a hearing. It's, it would be Chris by himself. Han, what was that last agenda item? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that one. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. So he is proposing agenda items for upcoming meetings where we are just um, discussing CONCOM sort of procedure and matters. And the last one was inviting Chris, Chris Bascom to come talk about fire safety considerations for battery storage facilities. And, and, so and the fire department requirements. We don't really know. So, you know, so in do. relation to the impact on wetlands, because he spoke to the bylaw working group quite a bit about those, about uh, how he would approach battery storage systems with fires. Yeah, but he's never talked to the CONCOM. Laura, is there like a yes. write-up or something? Yes, about that? there's a recording and there is plenty of materials that have been written up, yes. Um, he 
you know, the questions of toxicity and how to handle burns. And um, that was all addressed during the bylaw working group. Um, yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually, Laura, I'm more concerned with what are his physical requirements for access, turnaround, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the, so the general the kinds, rule, the kinds of things that could tip a project upside down. Yeah. So the general he rule, get that information out first. Yeah. So the, um, the recording will, I, I think it'd be helpful for you to listen to the recording and then see if you still want him to come speak. The general recommendation for any standalone battery storage system in the event of a fire is actually to let it be and let it burn um, and to not access. And Aaron, what, uh, Aaron, I think you were there too. Um, were you there in that meeting with the fire commissioner? I can't remember. It was a, um, but I think I suggest rather than asking him to come to our commission, I think we should first start by doing our homework and listening to the recording that was already made. Because we- if the, if the recommendation is to let it burn, why does he have access requirements? Because you need access requirements for the surrounding area to the battery, Alex. I don't know if this is the right time, but please listen to the recording before. I mean, I just don't so, want to waste the time. I really don't want to talk about it. All I wanted to do was identify what I think is a need. If you want to send out a link, that would be great. What's the opposition, Laura? I'm just suggesting that rather than asking the guy to come, the fire department chief to come around to all of our meetings, I'm not opposed, but we see no, spend no, 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 no. No, one meeting. Well, whatever. I'm just saying he already spoke on this matter for specifically for battery storage. My suggestion is to be courteous of his time just to listen to what already has been discussed. But you could invite him. But I'm just saying if you have other questions, um, it might be, you know, courteous to watch the recording first. Is, so is there do you like know offhand where that recording the date or yeah. anything? Like yeah, I can find that. Okay. That'd be awesome. And then that would probably at least make it a more efficient conversation if we move forward with yes. That. That's good. So I also sent out a copy of the solar plan to everybody on the commission. And if there's um and, um so we have that. So great. Let's let's listen to the tape and move forward on that okay so you said you had three i have two no. the other one is uh a discussion about the wetland the regs generally and specifically about the 20 percent threshold and to actually look at the entire language that's associated with the 20 percent rule i don't want to go through the mitigation formula that that michelle developed that's not not what i want to talk about I want to talk about our handling of the 20% threshold and look at the language in the regs and have a discussion about our process. Okay. Um, I mean, it's good development for the commission to talk about these things. I'm wondering like how much time we'll have to allocate to them, like a 20 minute hearing spot. Um, first of all, Show of hands, and I see Dave probably wants to say something. <laughs> but uh, is who's interested in putting aside some time to? Well, definitely the land use subcommittee. That's got to come to us when that's ready. Um, Chris Bascombe, I think we should do our due diligence. I agree on that one first, and then read whatever is available, and then just discussing that twenty percent. Does anyone have any comments? Uh, I think I think we could probably tackle. I'm sorry, I just jumped right in. Um, we could probably tackle them one at a time. We don't have to have them all on in one oh, uh, meeting. I, I, think... I think I I think it would be really rough to do that because uh, we have so much other work to do. That's just my that's my only comment. I, have. I agree with him. Yeah. So I'm thinking like you know 20 minutes when time allows to fit this in when we know that we have continuances and um, a lighter load, which does happen from time to time. So maybe we just need to coordinate that more finely. Uh, uh, if, if not the volunteering, but if Dave feels like he's got little to report at a certain time, maybe we could usurp that position or something in the beginning when everybody's not. Um, looking to to depart from the meeting i guess my only go ahead andre sorry no sorry i was gonna say my only my only thought is um i think 
I think making sure we do it at a time where we have a letter agenda, you know, I think right now, I mean, these are long meetings, guys, you know, m many of us have young children, jobs, many things going on. So I'm just always, I think all the things you brought up are important. Um, but I, I just want to ask everyone to be patient in terms of when we can find time to schedule them, uh, because it's difficult. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. Yeah, so I, I think that we can keep these in mind for the next meetings coming up and just when there's a space that looks like we can talk about it, why don't we put it on the agenda? Okay, Andre? I forgot to put my hand back down, but I could make a motion. Let's do it. <laughs> I move to adjourn. I second that. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Laura? Aye. <laughs> Bruce? Aye. Alex? Thanks, Andre. Aye. Uh, Jason? Aye. I'm an aye. And so am I. Sorry, Andre. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good an aye. I'm way past you here. All right, everyone. Good night. Have a good night, guys. Good night. Bye.